Hey guys welcome back to channel, so in this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto had overpower trident, water god. This is part 1, and if you want more then please leave a like share and subscribe, also like aim is 200 likes for next part, let's get started. Are you sure this is it Jiraiya-kun? Hiruzen yelled over the everlasting rain that was the reason this land was known as the land of rain. My source told me that he saw a blonde boy with blue eyes be taken into this cave. The Toad Sage said gesturing to the small cave that was in front of their small team, consisting of his sensei and one squad of Anbu. Hiruzen nodded and turned to the team he brought with him. Kakashi-kun I want you and your team to scout through the cave. Keep your eyes open for any traps and any signs of Naruto-kun. A small chorus of highs was heard before Kakashi and his team disappeared into the black cave, leaving Jiraiya and himself alone. We have failed him. Jiraiya said sadly. Hiruzen nodded he didn't have to ask to know who he was talking about. It was almost a full month ago when they had found Naruto was gone. He had sent all the available Anbu to search the village for the boy, but after a day of searching with no results, they concluded that he was no longer in the village, if he was taken, or if he left on his own hadn't been decided. The Sand I may tried to send all the hunter nin he had after Naruto, but when he tried the civilian council had stopped him, stating that since Naruto was not a shinobi, only they could send someone after him, which they choose not to claiming that they hoped the demon brat was dead. He was surprised when his old teammates lead by Danzo, tried to convince the council to send someone after the boy, but Hiruzen was pretty sure they were just scared that an enemy village had captured Naruto, in hopes of using him to destroy Konoha. When nothing worked he had left to send a message to Jiraiya to get him to use all of his connections to find the young blonde. While he was doing this the council decided to add insult to injury, by getting rid of his law on the grounds that the boy was dead, and the villagers deserved to know. So before he even heard about it they had called a village meeting and yelled out for everyone to hear how Naruto was the reincarnation of the QB, and now he was finally dead. The village had started to celebrate almost instantly and tell their children about the demon child, effectively killing any chance of Naruto being accepted by his generation. Hiraya had finally showed up in the village two days ago, stating that he had one of his spies with Orochimaru see a boy that matched Naruto's description. When the civilian council found out from his secretary, who was sent to Ibiki, they tried to stop him, but he frightened them with the idea of Orochimaru getting the boy to follow them. They automatically agreed on getting the boy back stating, they would rather have the demon under their control than Orochimaru's. Do you think he will ever be able to forgive us sensei? Jiraiya asked. He had been blaming himself ever since he had gotten the scroll. He is a kind soul so he will forgive us, but the question you should be asking is if we deserve to be forgiven. Hiruzen let out a heavy sigh. And if he doesn't forgive us then we will work for the rest of our lives to earn it. He thought sadly. They both stood in the rain and waited for one of the Anbu to come and get them. They only had to wait for a few minutes before a man with gravity-defying white hair appeared from the cave. Did you find him? Jiraiya asked quickly not giving Kakashi the chance to speak. Kakashi nodded slowly. We found him. His said with his teeth and fists clenched. Is he alive? Hiruzen asked worriedly. Alive? Yes. The two older men let out the breath they didn't realize they were holding. But he is not the same. Kakashi continued catching the men's attention again. What do you mean not the same? Jiraiya asked wondering what his old teammate did to his godchild. See for yourself. Kakashi walked back into the cave with Jiraiya and Hiruzen at his heels. The temperature in the cave seemed to drop, and the air became musky. Kakashi led them through a serious halls that ran throughout the cave, all lit by a dull torch that offered little to no light. They turned down another hallway that had a metal door at the end, that had a bright light shining through the bottom of the door. The older men began to walk faster as they got closer to the door, especially after the strong smell of blood entered their noses. Right before they could open the door they heard a few shouts and a load bang. All three men pulled a kunai before Kakashi kicked the door in revealing a bright white room. Gureya and Hiruzen gasped when they saw the room. White tiles covered the floor and walls with bright lights hanging from the ceiling. On the right side of the room a large workbench held many different medical and experimental instruments with vials of strange-looking liquid. But what was on the far wall was what had caused the two older men to gasp. On the far wall a small body lay on a metal table, but the numerous machines that kept the body alive, blocked the body's face from few. The only thing they could tell was his body was covered with blood. Imato. Kakashi yelled catching the two older men's attention. They followed his line of sight to see three of Kakashi's anbu restraining a cat mask anbu from cutting the throat of a boar mask anbu with a kunai. Stand down. Kakashi yelled again as he put a hand on the cat mask anbu's shoulder. But Yamato refused to drop the kunai he had on the man's throat. This son of a bitch tried to kill Naruto-kun. Yamato growled out in an uncharacteristic show of emotion. It was then that the three men saw the discarded kunai that was on the ground next to Boar's feet. 
Harrison's eyes narrowed dangerously as he allowed his full amount of killer intent wash over the man, causing him turn pale and feel weak. You better have a good explanation for this. The old Hokage said calmly. We need to kill the demon brat before he taints Konoha with the QBs and Orochimaru's power. Bor said quickly hoping the sand I may would free him and kill the little demon before he woke up and killed everyone. Wrong answer. Anbu take him into custody, Ibiki will take care of him when we get back to Konoha. Yamada let go of the man as the rest of the Anbu quickly knocked Bor out and hauled the man out of the room, leaving Yamato, Kakashi, Jiraiya, and Hiruzen behind. Is that Naruto? Jiraiya asked as went to move towards the still unidentified body, but before he could take another step, Kakashi grabbed his shoulder stopping him. You can't go near him. Kakashi said at Jiraiya's questioning glance. And why exactly can't I go near him? Jiraiya asked. Yamato drew the kunai he still had in his hand back causing the two older men to lean towards him. I'll show you why. He said quickly before he was taken down by one of the legendary Sanin and his sensei. They both looked at each other before nodding at Yamato giving him the go-ahead. Yamato flicked his wrist shooting the kunai across the room faster than what should have been possible. As the kunai got within a few feet of the body a sheet of water seemed to appear from thin air and knock the kunai harmlessly to the ground. Hiruzen and Jiraiya started dumbly as the water seemed to evaporate into the air again leaving no sign it was ever there to begin with. What the fuck? Jiraiya and Hiruzen said together. From what we were able to find. Arachimaru was trying to give him a new bloodline limit which he obviously accomplished. But he most likely wasn't expecting the water to act on its own, so when he had to move him, he was no longer able to get close enough to get him. Yamato concluded. Do you think he is controlling it subconsciously? Hiruzen asked as he took a step forward to try and see around the machines. We aren't sure Hokage-sama. Hmm. Hiruzen said as he took another step forward. If I'm right then I think he controlling it subconsciously so the only way we are going to get to him is if someone he trusts is around and the only one that he truly trusts is two Raymond Cooks and myself. He said as he moved cautiously towards the boy. As he got to the machines a wall of water appeared blocking his path. He frowned slightly before placing his hand on the hard surface. The water seemed to pulse under his hand before it evaporated into the air, giving him access to the young boy. He moved a few of the machines back before letting out a loud gasp. In front of him lay a young boy with many scars running up his arms and chest with a single thin scar running over the right side of his mouth. He was clad in only a tan pair of pants that had streaks of dry and new blood running down them, much like the boy's body was. Hiruzen began to hope this wasn't Naruto who had to go through so much pain at such a young age. Any doubts of the boy's identity disappeared when he saw the bright blonde hair that only a few people in the world have ever had. Is it him sensei? Jiraiya asked after a few minutes of Hiruzen just staring at the body. Hiruzen turned to his old student and nodded grimly. Yes it is him. He said as he pulled out a small towel that lay on the table and began to wipe the blood off the boy. How is he? Kakashi asked. They could all see the amount of blood that was on the boy. He is fine for now. Hiruzen said causing the men to relax slightly. But I swear on my wife's grave that I will make Rachimaru suffer before I kill him for what he has done. He allowed all of his killer intent to leak out of him as he spoke. He finished getting most of the blood off of the boy before he threw the towel to the side and picked him up bridal style. Let us get back to Kanoha as quick as possible. Hiruzen said as he walked out the door with the three men behind him. It would be a long trip back to Kanoha and Naruto could still use some medical attention. XXXXX. Back in Kanoha eight hours later. Back in Kanoha four men stood around the Hokage's office watching the small blonde boy sleep on the couch. They all had one thought on their minds. What were they going to do with the boy? They had taken extra care in not alerting anyone of their presence, so they wouldn't have to deal with the council yet. It was still early in the morning, so only a few shinobi were in the Hokage's tower, so it was easy enough to get around unseen. But the council would be up soon, and they would want to know about how the mission went. We can't just throw him back into the village. His apartment was burnt down right after he was declared dead by the council. The entire village populaces will most likely attempt to kill him, and now that includes his own generation. Yamato said sadly. Yamato's right any chance of Naruto having a normal life was ripped away from him when the council revealed his secret. Kakashi agreed as he read his favorite copy of Icha Icha to get his mind off what has happened to his sensei's son. Which we are going to have to tell him when he wakes up to make sure he doesn't hear it from some villager and have a mental breakdown from it. Jiraiya concluded. The villagers are another thing we have to worry about. Just in case Naruto doesn't have control of the water and some villagers try to hurt him like they used to they will either be blocked or the water will kill them. Hiruzen said as he rubbed his temples trying to stop the incoming headache. There are only two safe options. We either allow him to live in the Anbu headquarters where he can train and be protected. Or we send him out of the village to train and grow without the hate of the villagers. 
Kakashi listed the only options he could think of that didn't have the chance of an ignorant fool being drowned. We would still have to worry about younger Anbu trying to kill him, and he wouldn't be safe if he left the village by himself. Yamato shot down both plans. What if we sent him with someone? Kakashi tried again and secretly hoped that he would be the one chosen to go with him. It's not like Anbu really needed him they had Yamato and Itachi, who was most likely going to be Anbu captain when he stepped down. And who would we send with him? Hiruzen asked, but he already knew that Kakashi was going to volunteer. He had already tried to adopt the boy, but the civilian council would never approve the papers. And you know I can't allow you to go with him. We are still trying to rebuild our forces from the QB attack, I can't allow one of my best shinobi to leave right now. Kakashi one visible eye dropped slightly before he went back to his book. What if I took him? Jurei offered drawing everyone's attention. None of them could deny the idea wasn't good. Jurei was strong enough to protect the boy. He could train him into a strong shinobi, and he could introduce Naruto to his spy network, so when he retires Konoha would still have a strong spy network. Does anyone have a reason why jiraiya Kun shouldn't take him? Hiruzen asked. When no one said anything he smiled and moved to his desk to make Naruto Jiraiya's apprentice. Now that we have that taken care of. What are we going to do when he turns 12 in 6 years and it's time for him to become a shinobi? After a few seconds of silence Kakashi looked up from his book and spoke first. Well I was planning on being his jonin sensei, but if he is going to be training with Yurei sama for the next six years, I'm pretty sure naruto come with at least jonin level. Especially if he is able to master his control of water. And if he is promoted to chunin it eliminates the problem of him being put on a genin team with hostile teammates and sensei. Yamato said. True but he will still have to do missions on teams that might see him as the QB Hiruzen said sadly. It was truly depressing when they couldn't put Naruto on a team for fear of him being stabbed in the back or left behind. What if we made a team like the Sanin consisting of myself, Naruto, and another person who I believe would love the opportunity. And if the time comes that we need someone else to help us, we could always take someone who we know won't let the QB cloud their judgment. Like Kakash Senpi or Asuma-san. Yamato suggested. Who would be the other person? Jiraiya asked wondering who would love to work with two of the village's pariah. Enko chan Hiruzen answered before Yamato could. It would be a good idea to place you three together. You have all been hated by the village because of things that were out of your control. And you would all protect each other's backs in battle and out. Kakashi and Jiraiya had to admit, it was a good idea. And it could prove to be one of the strongest teams to be in Konoha since the Sanin. The last wood user, the snake mistress of Konoha, and a boy that could control water. It would be a powerful team indeed. Then it's decided. Naruto-kun will go with Jiraiya for six years to train and be protected, then he will come back and join Yamato-kun's team with Anko-chan. The Sandai Mei said as the three men nodded in agreement. Naruto-kun is beginning to move. Kakashi said as he put his book away and stepped forward to greet the boy. XXXXX. Naruto's Mindscape. Naruto stood in front of a large metal cage held tight by a piece of paper with a kanji for seal on it. Two metal tubes extruded from the walls one red one blue that connected at the doorway and turned into a deep purple. Naruto was used to standing here after a month of coming to the same almost every day. But something was different this time. Droplets of water floated around the entire room and seemed to be going out the doorway too. Naruto reached a hand out and touched one of the droplets causing it to float away. Plushy wake up. Naruto ordered as he kept staring at the water droplets. The red eyes with slitted pupils opened before focusing on the young scarred blonde. What do you want kid? The figure asked. Why the hell is there water floating around? The blonde asked impatiently. Oh that. The figure said as if he was just seeing the floating water. Orochimaru injected you with the genes to a new bloodline. It said as if it was the most obvious thing in the world. Why haven't you destroyed it yet? The boy's eyes narrowed and he stepped towards the cage. I didn't destroy it because I didn't see a reason to. The fool gave you the ability to control water. Why in the hell would I destroy something like that? Because I told you to you damn plushie. The figure growled loudly and a red chakra started to leak out of the cage towards the boy. Do not forget your place kit. I am the QB the king of demons you're just the lucky little monkey that was privileged enough to hold me. Be thankful that I gave you such a gift. QB said his killing intent began to leak out to try and scare the six year old boy but to no avail as he just glared back and allowed his chakra to explode out pushing away the QBs. Do not forget your place you fucking plushie. You do as I say or I swear to Kami I'll take away all of your senses and leave you in that cage for the rest of my life. The QB felt a shiver run down his spine at the thought of being cut off for life, the scariest thing is that the kid could and most likely would do it. Can you destroy the damn bloodline or am I stuck with it? Naruto asked after he calmed down a little but he still glared at the large fox. You're stuck with it kid. Fuck. The blonde boy whispered. 
You said I could control water right? Getting a nod from the fox he continued. Is it just water or is it all liquid? He asked causing the QP to grin. You're already planning to escape. He asked liking the way his container was thinking. To answer the question, yes, you can control any form of liquid. Hell if you concentrated enough you could even control the water that runs through a man's body. It would cost you a lot of chakra, but your enemy would be fucked. The QB finished with a large grin from just imagining his container ripping the water out of his enemy's bodies, it would be a slow death. Well if I'm stuck with it, I might as well learn how to control it. Naruto said as he looked at the water. When you wake up you should be able to form water from thin air and use it to either make an ultimate defense or make different weapons and jutsu with it. If anyone tries to use a water jutsu on you or any sub-element with water in it, you should be able to either make it miss you or completely take control of it and attack your opponent with it, you're basically a water user's worst nightmare. Naruto tried to control the water around him, but to no avail. How do I control it? He asked the QB. From what I have been able to tell, when you wake up you should be able to feel the water in the air around you and any body of water that's close to you. To control it just focus on it and use your hand motions to control it. Once you get used to it you should be able to control it with just mental commands. Alright send me back. It's time for me to escape. Naruto said as he closed his eyes and waited for the familiar push that came when he was pushed out of his mind. Oh yeah I forgot to tell that the one you all old man and a group of his anbu came and rescued you. The QB grinned when Naruto's eyes shot open in surprise, the first emotion he had shown that wasn't hate. You have been in Konoha for almost an hour now. You goddamn plushie. Naruto yelled right before he was pushed out of his mindscape. XXXXX. Back in the Hokage's office. Naruto's eyes open snapped open when he felt the other presence in the room. He sat up quickly and looked around. He instantly noticed that he was in the Hokage's office with four other people, one being the Hokage. He took a minute to look at each man, starting with a tall man with extremely long and spiky white hair tied back into a ponytail, with two shoulder-length bangs that framed both sides of his face. He also had red lines that ran down from his eyes and wore a horned forehead protector with a kanji for oil. He wore a green short shirt kimono and matching colored pants, under which he wore mesh armor that showed out of the sleeves and legs of his outfit. His outfit was completed with hand guards, a simple black belt, traditional Japanese jetta, a red cloak with two simple yellow circles, and a scroll on his back. The next man who stood next to him had gravity-defying gray hair. He wore the standard Kanoha ninja uniform with iron guard gloves. He also wore a mask over the lower part of his face, with his forehead protector over his left eye. The next man had brown hair with black eyes. He wore the standard Anbu attire including the katana strapped to his back. He also wore a mask-style forehead protector similar to the Nidai Maze. A cat mask that Naruto recognized as one of the Anbu that had saved him from a few mobs. Now that he thought about it the gray-haired man reminded him of the dog-masked Anbu that was usually with Cat. While he inspected the men they were inspecting him. They all noticed that his neutral facial expression never faltered. And his ice-blue eyes. Did I need you to try and feel the water around you then when you can feel it condense it into a bowl or something? The QB's voice said from the back of Naruto's head. He did as instructed and closed his eyes to try and focus on the water around him. It was small at first, but the more he concentrated the easier it was to feel the water that seemed to float around the room. The big source of water sat on the desk, which he guessed was a glass of water. He could also feel a faint source of water coming from the four men in front of him, but it was extremely weak. Refocusing on the water molecules around him he held his hand out and willed the water to form in his hand. After a few seconds he heard a loud gasp come from the men in front of him. The blonde opened his eyes to see a fist-sized ball of water resting in his hand. He threw it up and down to test its strength. He found that it felt rock solid, but it was as light as a feather. But job kit. The QB congratulated the boy. Before I forget it might be a good idea for you to get something to carry some water around with you at all times. A boda bag would be perfect. QB said before he cut the mental link with the boy. Naruto played with the ball for another minute before he allowed the water to evaporate back into the air around him. Naruto-kun are you okay? A voice Naruto was thankful to hear asked him. He looked up into the face of the Sandai Mei. It was nice to finally be around a trusted person once more. I'm guessing you saved me? Naruto asked although he already knew the answer. The four men noticed that his facial expression didn't change once and his voice had stayed at the same octave. To those who knew the boy it was extremely disturbing. It didn't help that his once bright blue eyes were now darker causing them to look like ice. Yes my old student Jureya Kun here. The sand I made pointed to the spiky-haired old man, who waved at Naruto with a smile on his face. Found out where you were being held so I got a group of Anbu together, and we went and rescued you from Orochimaru. Naruto's eyes narrowed at the man's name. Can you tell us what happened to you Naruto-kun? 
Kakashi asked the boy whose eyes seemed to darken even more than they already were. Then I get some new clothes first. Naruto asked as he looked down at his bare chest. He ran his fingers over the scars that ran down his chest and arms. His left hand absentmindedly touched the scar that ran over the right side of his mouth. Oh yes let me see what I have. The sand I may said as he went back to his desk and shoveled through a drawer. He pulled out a blue summoning scroll and inspected it briefly before throwing it to the young boy. Do you know how to work that? He asked the scarred boy who nodded before he placed the scroll on the ground and opened it before adding a bit of chakra to it. The poof of smoke shot from the scroll reveling a chunin vest. Naruto looked at it questioningly before turning to the old man. It's all I have at the moment and the stores aren't open yet. Here is an answer to the unasked question. Naruto nodded before he slipped the vest on and closed it to cover most the scars on his chest, but the ones on his arms and face were still very visible. Since you didn't bring me a pair of clothes from my apartment, I'm going to go ahead and guess that the villagers either destroyed them or burnt my apartment down. Naruto said with no emotion. The four men dropped their heads. It was sad when the boy was expecting something like this to happen. Unfortunately you are correct Naruto-kun. The sand I may confirmed his thoughts. Damn plushy. Naruto mumbled causing the men to look at him like he was crazy. Plushy? Jiraiya asked. Naruto looked at him like it was obvious. The QB. He said causing the men to gasp for what seemed like the hundredth time. How did you find out? The sand I may asked getting ready to find the man and kill him for reveling the secret. Orochimaru told me about two weeks after he got to me. He said that's why he wanted me to test experiments on because the plushy wouldn't allow me to die. The four men cursed the snake for doing this to the small blonde. You are not the QB Naruto Kun you are only the container. Kakashi said hoping the boy wouldn't succumb to the thoughts of the villagers. The blonde chuckled darkly. You're right I'm not the QB, but when the time comes that I need to protect the people I care about, I will become the QB I will use his power to strike fear into the hearts of my enemies. And now with the power to control water I will one day be strong enough to protect everyone. The boy said as he formed a water kunai that he quickly threw into the opposite wall which pierced all the way to the ring. Naruto had to remember to increase his chakra control. He had used almost 25% of his chakra just to make that kunai. But it is very honorable of you Naruto-kun. Yamato said remembering when he said something similar when he was still learning to control his wood release. Can you tell us what happened now Naruto-kun? Hiruzen asked after a few minutes of silence. Naruto's eyes narrowed again as he sat back down on the couch. I'll make this short. I was tricked by a man who I thought I could trust. He used a poison to knock me out. When I woke up I was in that cave strapped to a table. Hirachimaru was there watching over me with a scalpel that seemed to be drenched in this black stuff. He told me that he was trying to make a poison that a demon's chakra couldn't even heal. At the time I had no idea what he was talking about, but I do know that after many different experiments, he finally got a poison that worked. Naruto said as he ran his hands over the many scars that ran around his arms. After he got the poison to work he would use it to cut me, then try to study how it worked. Obviously it took a few tries to figure it out. He chuckled slightly. He then went on to tell me about the QP being sealed inside of me. He attempted to get me to hate Kanoha and join him, but when he realized that I wouldn't betray Kanoha, he started injecting me with different liquids that were meant to alter my genes and give me a bloodline, but before they could work I was pulled into my mind where I met the QP. I apparently impressed him when I didn't flinch when he released his killing intent at me. So for a reward he didn't allow any of the liquids to work on me. But apparently he decided the last one Orochimaru injected me with was too good to let go. The next thing I knew I was here. He finished with a faraway look in his eyes. Who was the man that betrayed you? Jiraiya asked hoping to find and torture the man before sending him to the seven rings of hell. I don't remember. Naruto said quickly before sending the men a leave it alone look. They all looked like they wanted to protest, but at the same time they didn't want to upset the boy. So what happened while I was gone? Naruto asked trying to change the subject. He instantly got worried when all the men looked a little scared. Well after we found that you were gone the civilian council declared you dead and destroyed the law I had made that forbid anyone from telling the younger generations about the QB being sealed inside. I did it hoping that you would have a normal life with a few friends, but pretty much any chance of that happening was destroyed when the council told the younger generations about you being the QB Naruto simply nodded not showing any sign that the news affected him. So what now? He asked as he leaned his head against the back of the couch. Well we thought about all of your options, and the best one we could think of is to send you out of the village with your Ayakun, so you can be trained and protected. You would come back in six years to become a shinobi. Hiruzen said. The young blonde looked at the tall spiky haired man before standing and walking closer to the sand I may. Can I trust him? Naruto whispered so the other men couldn't hear. He is my best student, you can trust him to make you a great shinobi and protect you. 
Hirazan whispered back. Barajimaru was one of your best students too, and he ended up experimenting on me for a month. Naruto whispered back harshly. Hirazan frowned slightly. I know and I am sorry for that, but believe me when I tell you that you can trust him. Naruto looked at the man with a calculating look. If it helps he is your godfather. Hirazan tried to get him to trust the old pervert. But unfortunately Naruto narrowed his eyes at the man for a brief second, but long enough for the experienced shinobi to catch. Fine I'll go with him. Naruto said with a monotone and blank face. I'm glad to hear that. Jiraiya smiled widely at the boy. He finally would have the chance to make it up to the boy and his father. When do we leave? The boy asked. As soon as possible to avoid the council. Jiraiya said as he opened the door for the boy. Goodbye Naruto-kun. The sand I may said as he knelt down to give the boy a hug, only for him to take a step back. I'm sorry but could you not touch me for right now? The boy explained when he saw the hurt look on the sand I may's face. It's not that he didn't like the old man, it's just that after a month of only being touched when they were going to cut or inject him with something, had made human contact a touchy subject for the boy. I'll see you in six years old man. Naruto smiled slightly to try and make the old Hokage happy before he turned and walked out the door, followed closely by Jiraiya. He is going to be a force to reckon with when he comes back. Kakashi said as he pulled his book out. Yes he will be. Yamato agreed before he placed his mask back on and saluted the Hokage. I'm going to go tell Anko about what has happened. He said before he disappeared in a swirl of leaves. Yeah I guess I might as well leave too. Kakashi said before giving a two-fingered salute before he disappeared in a similar fashion as Yamato. The next six years are going to be very boring without you here Naruto-kun. The Sandai Mei said before he went back to his desk and started getting ready for the council meeting, that would probably consist of a lot of yelling. The Sandai Mei looked at the three shinobi that stood at attention in front of him. He called each of them here so they could hear what Naruto has become over the past six years of his life. Jiraiya who stood next to him and trained the boy for five years before Naruto went off by himself to train and travel the world for a while, had asked for them to be here so they didn't make any deadly mistakes. What have you called us here for old man? The only girl in the group asked impatiently. The woman had light brown pupil-less eyes. Her violet hair was done up in a short somewhat spiky ponytail. She wore a tan overcoat, complete with a fitted mesh bodysuit that stretches from her neck down to her thighs. The mesh seems to be somewhat transparent, since her body can be seen underneath. She wears a dark orange skirt, as well as a forehead protector, a small pendant, and shin guards. The pendant is on a thick cord rather than a chain to prevent it from being easily torn off in combat. And even though he couldn't see it he knew that the curse seal given to her by his old student was on the left side of her neck. I have called you here today so Jiraiya Kun here can tell you about your new teammate that should be showing up later today. Hirazan informed his shinobi and had apparently forgotten about her lack of respect that she showed early, just like Naruto she showed respect, so those she liked with nicknames. Naruto's coming back. One of the men at Anko's side asked completely forgetting about the little orange book that he was reading before. The man had gravity-defying spiky white hair. He wore the standard Jonin uniform with a black mask covering the bottom half of his face, with his forehead protector slanted to cover his left eye. The only difference in his uniform was the black gloves that had metal plates for extra protection. His name was Hada Kakashi or better known as the Copy Nin. It's been a little over six years, and I asked him to come back to become a ninja with the rest of his generation. Wait do you mean that we are going to have to train some little brat? Anko asked. She did not want to train some green-eared spoiled brat for the next year, just because he had a hard life. Haha. <laughs> you aren't going to train him anything. Hell he will most likely be the one teaching you a few things. Jiraiya smiled at the now pissed off women. She has no idea who she is messing with, although thinking back to it, we probably should have told her the full story of what happened to Naruto. She would probably have a lot more respect for the boy. There is no way that some spoiled little brat is going to be able to teach me anything, I'm a fucking jonin for Kami's sake. Anko growled out. Spoiled? Hirazan looked at her questioningly. What exactly did you tell her Yamato? He asked the final man, who still hasn't taken his cat mask off. Yamato has short brown hair and black eyes. He wore the standard Konoha Anbu uniform. Hirazan knew that he has a mask-style forehead protector that frames his face, similar to that of Tabarama Senju, thinking about it, he was the only Konoha in that wore that style of forehead protector. I didn't tell her anything Hokage-sama. Yamato answered. Why? Hirazan couldn't think of any reason for Yamato to not tell Anko about Naruto. You made the information an S-class secret, so I was forbid to tell her. Yamato was beginning to get confused. The Sandai Mei was the one who made it a secret, why did he think that he told Anko? At the council meeting I did but you told her before that didn't you? Hirazan asked as he began to put the pieces together in his head. The wood user shook his head slowly. 
No she was in the forest of death and I wasn't able to find her before the meeting was called. During their conversation Anko was getting more and more confused, which in turn made her more and more pissed. What the fuck are you talking about? She almost yelled at the two men. Deer is inside before he looked to Anko. He really didn't want to tell this story again, but it seemed like he didn't have any other option. It all started about an hour after young Naruto and Jiraiya left. XXXXX. Flashback. Six years ago. Council room. What do you want? Hiruzen asked harshly as he sat at the head of the table with Yamato and Kakashi at his sides, who had just been called to act as his guards. All of the council gawked at him silently, he had never been so forward before. But the sand I made didn't care he was tired and it had been a long couple of days. We have called you here to ask how the mission went. Danzo said after regaining himself faster than everyone else. It went well. The monkey summoner answered. You already know what happened you old warhawk, I don't know why you insist on making me tell you. The sand I made was no fool and he knew that Danzo had shinobi reporting to the old warhawk, but he had no way to prove it or he would have stopped the battle crazed fool years ago. Danzo frowned slightly before regaining himself. Details. Danzo knew his old teammate would try to avoid the details of what really happened and try to cover it up, so when his spy told him about what had happened at Orochimaru's base, he had instantly called this meeting so he could get his hands on the demon child. Deer is inside again before he placing his elbows on the table and resting his chin on his interlocked fingers. Jurea's intel was correct and we found the base easily. It seemed to be abandoned a few hours before we got there because Orochimaru and all of his subordinates were gone. Don't ask. Don't ask. Don't ask. He prayed silently. What about the die mean boy? A civilian council member stopped himself from calling the boy a demon when he was glared at by Hiruzen and the two Anbu behind him. He was been found and brought back to the village. The sand I may tried to avoid the upcoming fight. Why did you save the demon? Hiyashi Hayuga asked. It was no secret that he hated the boy and openly encouraged the members of his clan to hurt the boy as much as possible. We saved no demon. We saved a boy you pompous ass. Someone said but they threw their voice so no one could tell who it was. Haishi's face went red in anger and his Byakugan activated. Who said that? He asked as he looked around widely. The sand I may chuckled lightly at Kakashi's antics before calming the situation. Calm down Hiashi. Hiashi deactivated his Byakugan, reluctantly, and returned to stoic attitude, but those around him could hear the few curses he was whispering. Here is and I have heard that the boy has a unique ability. Danzo said setting up his plan to get the boy under his control. Hiruzen glared at his former teammate. So that's your plan you senile old fool. Well yes he does have the Kayubi sealed inside of him. He said to annoy the crippled man. Not that. I meant the boy's ability to control water. Danzo almost yelled out causing the council to gasp. What do you mean control water Danzo? Shikakunara asked as he finally lifted his head from the desk. The same question ran through the heads of the rest of the council. Before Danzo could answer the old monkey summoner cut him off. He means that Orochimaru used him for an experiment that caused Naruto to gain complete control of water. I won't tell them that he also made a poison that actually hurt Naruto or one of these fools might try to get some to hurt Naruto. We have to kill the demon. A civilian council member yelled, the other council members yelled out supporting him. Why should we kill him? Shikaku asked causing everyone to look at him. Now that he controls water and possible the Kyubi's chakra one day he could become one of the strongest shinobi this world has ever seen. The sand I may smiled at his jonin commander for not seeing the boy as a demon. Exactly he could use the power to destroy all of us with it. A civilian said. We cannot allow him to taint Kanoha with the Orochimaru's or the Kyubi's power. Another civilian spoke. He is an abomination with these abilities Orochimaru has given him we need to kill the demon before he learns to control it. Another civilian yelled. Most of the shinobi council looked over at the cat mask Anbu behind the sand I may. They all knew that he had the wood bloodline limit like the Shadai Hokage and that he got it from Orochimaru. They all watched to see if he would make a move, but he made no sign that he would do anything to the foolish council member. Inside Yamato was pissed at being called abomination, even though the insult wasn't directly sent at him it was still insulting. Anko and himself were constantly abused because of that goddamn snake, and now Naruto, who was already judge for the Kayubi, would now have to deal with Orochimaru too. The boy's life had just gotten even more difficult. That's enough. Saratobi yelled causing all attention to turn to him. I see that most of you have chosen to hate the boy for things out of his control just like the Kayubi, so now I'm going to have to stop this just like I did with the Kayubi. Which you all fucked up. From now on Naruto's unique ability to control water will be an S-class secret until the time he comes back from his long-term training trip with my student Jiraiya. This meeting is now dismissed.
Hiruzen along with Kakashi and Yamato at his side walked out of the room with a majority of the council screaming curses and threats that they all knew they would never be able to hold up. Hey you. Just in case you missed it in chapter 1. The council revoked Hiruzen's law about the Kayubi because Naruto was presumed dead, so the entire village knows about the boy holding the Kayubi. XXXXX. Then flashback. By the end of the story Anko was shaking and furry, for what reason the men had yet to figure out by Hiruzen and Yamato, and still covered their baby makers, just in case the anger was directed at them. Anko was seeing red as the story finished. She was pissed for three reasons. Number one was that Orochimaru had captured experimented on someone, and when there was a rescue she wasn't told about it. Number two was that the council had tried to kill the boy for reasons beyond his control, just like they did to her and Yamato. And third, she didn't get the chance to possibly help the boy who had suffered the same fate as her own. She knew that she couldn't do anything about the first two reasons yet, but the two men who were responsible for her not getting to help the boy were in the same room right now, so they would have to do for now. How could you not tell me about this sooner? She yelled at Yamato and Hiruzen, who cringed when her anger was directed at them. If I would have known I would have helped the boy get through it all. He wouldn't have had to go through all of it on his own without anyone to care for him. She continued. Are you forgetting something? Kakashi asked drawing her anger towards him. He had lived for six years without anyone there to help him go through the hate of the villagers for having the Kayubi sealed inside of him. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't remember you ever trying to help him through that. So don't get so pissed at them when you did nothing to help stop it from ever happening. Kakashi said coldly. Anko gritted her teeth and turned on the one-eyed scarecrow. Who are you to talk Kakashi I never saw you stepping up to help the boy. She accused and went to hit the man, but before she could she found herself slammed against the wall that was to her back with her hands held above her head and a kunai to her neck, Kakashi was leaking ki that made the temperature of the room to drop drastically. She tried to rip her arms out of Kakashi's grasp, but he didn't even budge, she had heard that he had upped his training for some reason, but she never suspected he would be strong enough to hold her back with only one hand. I helped Naruto-kun by stopping 598 assassination attempts and another 672 kidnapping attempts with Yamato-kun and Itachi-kun at my sides. In six years we always saved him until the day we was kidnapped when we were all out on a joint mission. He growled out. Yamato and Jiraiya moved up and put a hand on each of his shoulders to calm the copy nin. Yamato-kun, Itachi-kun, and I did everything we could to help the boy just get through the day when all you ever did was drink and fuck around with people to get over your own self-pity, so don't you ever say I didn't help the boy when I did everything I could. He placed the kunai back into his pouch and let her hands drop to her sides, before turning his back to her and returning to where he used to stand. Okay well now that that's taken care of I would really like to hear about young Naruto-kun. Effectively changing the subject he turned to Jiraiya, indicating that he should start. Jiraiya cleared his throat before starting. I'll start by telling you all of his quirks. What do you mean by quirks? Anko cut him off. He means Naruto-kun has developed some strange attributes like most shinobi. Examples are your own sadistic personality, Kakashi Senpi's porn, Jiraiya's acts of stupidity, and my own enjoyment of scaring people. Yamato answered. Anko nodded in understanding before Jiraiya continued. He brought out four bags of hard candy from his kunai pouch that he threw to each person. His first quirk started after I gave him a piece of candy to calm his nerves as we were leaving the village six years ago. Ever since that day he will eat a piece of candy when he begins to get stressed or if you want him to do anything and I mean anything. That's why I gave you the bags so if you need him to help you defeat someone or help you train or if you want him to accept a mission you need to give him a piece of candy or he won't do it. Do you mean if we are about to die he won't save us unless we give him a piece of candy? Kakashi asked looking a bit skeptical. Gureya nodded a few times. He won't allow you to die, but he will let your opponent kick the hell out of you before he saves you, then he will demand candy, after which if you don't give him he won't help you again until you give him a full bag. Okay then. Yamato said as he placed the bag in his kunai pouch with the other three following his example. When they were all done with the candy Jiraiya started again. His second quirk is his tendency to call everyone he knows longer than a day by a nickname. For example he calls me Toad, the Kayubi plushie, Anko chuckled at the idea of calling the King of Demons plushie and Sensei Monkey. Hiruzen raised his eyebrow slightly. He calls us by our summons. No, he makes up the nicknames by the person's personalities, it's just a coincidence that our summons match our personalities. Does he call Orochimaru Snake? Yamato asked. Hiraya gave a small chuckle before answering. Nope, Naruto-kun calls him pedophile. When I asked why he didn't call him Snake, Naruto-kun said that snakes are proud and strong serpents that have had their names soiled because of a traitor that doesn't deserve the right to summon their kind. Anko smiled at the boy's description of snakes, the boy had gained a few points as far as she was concerned. 
Is that all of his quirks Jiraiya kun? Hiruzen asked. Unfortunately no, he was one more that you all need to hear and respect or it might get you killed. He said seriously, which caused everyone to straighten up and pay attention. No matter what happens you can never touch him, and when I mean touch I mean just lightly poking him will get you killed. Why can't we touch him? Anko asked. Because of what happened to him he was grown a deep fear of physical contact. In the five years I trained him the farthest I got to touching him was placing my hand on his shoulder, and I can only do that when he is prepared for it. What happens if you do touch him? Ureya pulled down the sleeve of his shoulder to reveal a round scar a few inches over his heart. Two years into the training we saved a small village from some nuke nin. When we were done the townspeople surrounded us to thank us. I got distracted by some women while Naruto collected a bag of candy from the mayor of the town. The girl that Naruto-kun had saved when Inuknin had used her as a hostage was so thankful she hugged him from behind. Now normally he could control his water and just push her off, but he wasn't ready for it, so he controlled his water subconsciously and almost pierced the girl through the heart. He would have succeeded if I hadn't used a body switch to take the blow for her. He let go of his shirt which successfully hid the scar. Every one of them stared at him with shocked expressions. It was hard to hurt a San in that badly, but for the boy to do it subconsciously just because he was touched was pretty scary. The San Dai Mei took out his pipe and lit it for the first time throughout that whole conversation. He took a deep breath before blowing the smoke out slowly. How strong do you think Naruto-kun is? He asked even though the boy would have to go through a test, no matter what Jiraiya's answer was. If he went all out he could beat you four out of five times. If he used the Kyuubi's chakra you would be lucky to last a few minutes. He smiled as everyone's jaws hit the ground. Although he does hide his true strength constantly. I have seen him fight a genin for 20 minutes and he actually made it look like it was a close fight. You can't be serious. Anko couldn't believe some little brat could be so strong. Even with the Kyuubi and the power to control water, the Hokage has years of experience and strength that makes him the strongest shinobi in the village. Ureya nodded slowly. I'm telling you the truth. He is most likely one of the strongest shinobi in the world if not the strongest. Wow. Was all Kakashi could come up with after hearing everything about the boy. I thought Nai-san told you not to tell anyone about us. A girl's voice startled everyone in the room. They turned to the door to find a small violet-haired girl with black pupil-less eyes, she appeared to be about 10 years old give or take a few years. She wore black skin-tight shorts that ran down to just above her knees. She had on a light blue sleeveless shirt that ran down to her mid-thigh, with a dark blue shinobi vest on top of it, with three blue ceiling scrolls on each side of the vest. Her arms and the rest of her legs were covered by white medical bandages. She had light blue shinobi sandals on that matched her shirt and a black kunai pouch on each leg. Isaribi chan you're early. Jiraiya appeared behind the girl and gave her a hug, but it looked more like he was trying to hide behind the small girl. Don't hide behind me. The girl said as she slipped out of his grasp. He warned you not to tell anyone about us. Jiraiya paled and began to sweat. Please help me Isaribi chan I'll do anything. Jiraiya pleaded as he bowed to the younger girl. Give me one good reason why I should help you grandpa. If Jurei would have looked up he would have seen her evil smirk. I'll buy you all the sushi you want if you help me. Jurei now had a stream of tears running down his face. Deal. The girl cheered before she passed everyone and sat in the chair in front of the Hokage's desk. Jurei let out a deep sigh before he stood up and faced everyone who was looking at him like he was crazy. Who is this girl Jurei kun Kakashi asked pointing to the girl. This, Jurei messed the girl's violet hair up, causing her to glare at him. Is Naruto kun's adopted sister. Sister? I didn't know he had a sister. Anko said as she reached out towards the girl. Just before her hand touched the girl's shoulder the temperature in the room dropped as someone released a huge amount of ki. If you value your life you won't touch catfish-chan. A cold voice spoke from the entryway of the door. Everyone turned to find a boy with blonde hair that was pulled back into a ponytail that hung to his shoulder blades with whisker marks on his cheeks. He was leaning against the door with his arms crossed in front of his chest. He stood about 5'2 with almost no fat on his body. He wore a dark blue shinobi vest that matched the girl's only three boda bags were strapped on the back. The bottom boda was brown with the kanji for shield on it. The middle boda was red with the kanji for curse. And finally the top boda was purple with the kanji for sword. He wore black anbu pants with a blue hilt that seemed to belong to a katana, but the blade was missing, they noticed that he didn't have a single kunai pouch on his body. With black combat boots and dark blue fingerless gloves for extra protection the boy was quite intimidating. But nothing compared to his ice-cold blue eyes that were currently focused directly on Anko. Nai-san. Isaribi yelled happily, she ran up and hugged the taller boy who simply patted her head, never taking his eyes off of Anko. Who is she? The boy asked to no one. 
she is going to be your new partner, and she is also the girl that was betrayed by a Rachi team that I told you about a few years back. Jiraiya answered quickly before Anko said something that would get her killed. Her name is Anko Midarashi. Naruto seemed to accept the answer for now as he turned to look at the other people in the room. He instantly recognized the two men next to Anko. Long time no see would kun, no eye. The two men sweat dropped at their nicknames while everyone else snickered. You do know that I have an eye under here, right? Kakashi asked pointing to his covered eye. But it is not your eye. Kakashi dropped his head in defeat. He does have a point. Kakashi thought to himself. You have grown Naruto-kun. Hiruzen smiled at the young blonde boy who only gave a small smile in return. That's bound to happen after six years. Naruto said with a smirk. How have you been Monkey Jiji? The sand I may smiled at his nickname. Good, but I have missed you. He walked around the desk and in front of the boy before sticking his hand out. Naruto seemed to have an inner battle with himself before he reached out and shook the man's hand. I have missed you as well. The blonde said before he pulled his hand back to his side quickly. Isoribi smiled widely at him before hugging his waist again. I would tell you about me, but it seems Toad Sensei has already done that. Naruto glared at the old perv who tried to hide behind Yamato. I had to tell them something. Jiraiya said sheepishly. One day that mouth of yours is going to get you killed you old fool. Naruto said before his head shot towards the door and he positioned himself in front of his little sister. The other occupants looked at him like he was crazy before someone knocked on the door, causing all of their jaws to drop. How did he know someone was there? They all thought except for Jiraiya and Isoribi who were used to him doing that. Come in. The sand I may yelled when he got over his shock. A young Chunin opened the door but stopped when he saw all of the shinobi in the room. He glared slightly at Naruto when he noticed the whisker marks on his cheeks, but he quickly schooled his features to try and hide his feelings, but everyone in the room still saw the look. The council has requested Jurei Asamas and your presence in a meeting. He said before glaring at Naruto again. They wanted that thing to come with you. He spat at Naruto. Everyone glared at the Chunin and was about to do something, but before they could the man found himself pinned against the wall by a wall of water. You are a fool. Naruto said as he glared at the man. The blonde flicked his left hand towards the door, resulting in the man being thrown out the door by the water he was encased in. Anko, Yamato, Kakashi, and Hiruzen gawked at the boy that was now smirking at them like nothing had happened. Shall we? He asked as he began walking out the door with Isoribi and Jiraiya at his side. Naruto followed the sand I made towards the council room. The others had left to go do their jobs, while Jiraiya had taken Isarabi to go get some sushi to settle their little agreement. Treacherous bastards Naruto thought bitterly. Why did he have to go to the damn council room while everyone else gets to go do their own things? Naruto kun no matter what they say, don't listen to them. They have no authority over you, and if my plan works then they never will have authority over you. The sand I may said as he took a few puffs of his newly packed pipe. Plan? What plan? The blonde asked. The sand I may looked back and gave him a knowing smile that held a little mischief. All you need to know is that the council isn't as smart as they believe. A small tick mark appeared on his head. I see that you still love cryptic answers. Naruto noted absentmindedly as he thought of all the times the old man had gave him a cryptic answer to all of his questions he had when he was a child. Who are my parents? Why does the village hate me? Why am I alone? All of those were questions I wanted to know the answers to, but now that I know the answers, there isn't a day that I wish that I was that naive little boy that would do anything for a bowl of ramen. The sand I may gave off a small chuckle as we turned another corner. It does bring me some entertainment. Yeah well it annoys the hell out of everyone else. The blonde mumbled. They both walked in silence for a few minutes just taking in the peace for once. They could have shunshined into the council room, but neither of them were in a rush to get there. Just being in each other's presence after so long was relaxing, and it gave both a sense of familiarity that they hadn't felt in years. Naruto formed some water out of the air before making it into a small monkey that sat on the sand I may's shoulder. The sand I may laughed lightly as he petted the monkey that reminded him of Konohimaru in some ways. It's amazing. Hiruzen spoke as he stroked the monkey's smooth head. Your abilities I mean. Even if you did get them from Orochimaru, you chose to use them in a good way. A way that will one day bring peace to this world for years, maybe even forever. Naruto shrugged slightly at the comment. At one time it was my dream to become Hokage and get the respect of Konoha, but now I'm no longer sure what I want to do. I mean my abilities give me the opportunity to become extremely strong and powerful, but it doesn't compare to the idea of just having someone to return to when I get back from a mission someone to love. Someone to love me. The monkey on Hiruzen's shoulder evaporated into the air once more as Naruto lost focus on his creation. Hiruzen gave a weak nod. Your life has been hell. No one could deny that, but in that hell you have become a better person, a stronger person. You will be able to make the decisions that no one else will. 
And hopefully, one day you will find someone to love you, and someone you can love. They were now standing outside of the council room doors. Both looking at each other with nothing but compassion. Hiruzen lightly placed his hand on Naruto's shoulder, causing the boy to flinch slightly, but his water didn't react. Hiruzen couldn't help but to smile lightly at the boy. It's time for the meeting. The Sandai Mei said opening the door for the blonde. Naruto nodded as he schooled his features into an emotionless mask. The room they walked into was large with little light. A big wooden U-shaped table took up most of the room with all of the clan heads already at their seats. The symbol of their clan hung behind their heads. The Sandai Mei moved to the only open chair that sat at the head of the table. The kanji for Hokage on a red flag sat behind him. Naruto moved to the middle of the room where a large spotlight had been placed to emphasis who they were talking to. An Anbu appeared from the shadows with kanji-covered handcuffs. Naruto hesitated as he looked at the Hokage for approval. After a short nod Naruto held his arms out allowing the Anbu to put the cuffs on his wrists, rather tightly if you asked him. The waterbender instantly felt the slight chakra drain, as the cuffs tried and failed to suppress his chakra. They must think that I need chakra to control my water. Naruto thought as he looked around at the now relieved faces of the counselors. It's not like those puny little cuffs could withstand your strength anyway. The Kyuubi's voice called from the back of his head. Naruto chuckled lightly causing the counselors to stare at him with concern. If I really need to I will just fuse some of your chakra into the seals. It will most likely overpower them and allow me to use my chakra again if I need it. State your name and rank. An old council member that sat in here is inside ordered. My name is Naruto Uzumaki. My rank is civilian, even though I could kill all of you. He mumbled the last part under his breath, even though Tsum and Yuzuka and the Sandai Mei heard and chuckled lightly. Do you know why we have called you here today? The old women on Hiruzen's other side asked. I was not informed. Naruto answered. We have called you here to ask you a few questions about your training trip. The Hyuga clan head said as he made his presence known. I will answer when I can. But I will withhold any information that I see fit. You will answer every question with the utmost honesty. The old woman yelled as she banged her hand against the table. Naruto glared at the old woman before he answered. I am a civilian so you can't order me to give you any information that I don't want to give. I don't even need to be here right now so be thankful that I feel generous today. Naruto answered with a small smirk, causing most of the council to glare at him and the others to silently laugh. Well now that we have that over with I will allow you all to ask whatever questions you want. The Sandai Mei said as he tried to get the ball rolling. He had better things to do today like paperwork itcha itcha. But as he just said. He doesn't have to answer any questions that he doesn't want to, so don't try to make any demands. The council nodded to each other in agreement, although most of them weren't happy about them not getting what they wanted. But they still had their backup plan so they would submit for now. I would like to know about your abilities. Shikaku Nara asked without even lifting his head from the table. I need to know where I could use you if we end up in war. Frontline, infiltration, village defense, etc etc. Shikaku finished with a small wave of his hand. Full control of water with a high affinity for earth jutsu, which is why I have the nickname Posidon in the land of water. I'm good with kinjutsu, sealing, and I have high regeneration rates. Naruto summarized without letting too much of his abilities out. Shikaku seemed to accept this answer as his shoulders slumped, and he seemed to have fallen back to sleep. What happened during your time in the land of water? Hiashi Hayuga asked with a voice that screamed arrogance. I trained with a toad for a while before I left and began to train by myself. Naruto answered as he thought about all of his adventures in the wet land. I found Catfish Chan a few months later and decided to adopt her. After that we trained together for a while before we came back here. Naruto finished obviously leaving out a shitload of details. Is that all? Hiashi asked skeptically. It's all you're going to get. Naruto answered with an innocent smirk, causing a tick to appear on the Hayuga head. Toza Akimichi cleared his throat quickly before Hiashi attempted to kill the boy. Who is this catfish and toad you speak of? He asked a question that was on the minds of a few other members. The toad is my student Jureya kun and catfish is Naruto-kun's adopted little sister Isarabi Uzumaki. She will be graduating with this year's academy students. The Sandai Mei answered before Naruto could. And he uses nicknames for everyone he likes or respects. For example he calls me Monkey and Kakashi no I. At this most of the council sweat dropped. In the reports we received it said that you had many scars running along your body. But as far as I can see you do not have a single scar on your visible skin. Inoichi Yamanaka commented as he looked at the boy's exposed arms. The reports are correct. But I had gotten sick of being asked about how I got the scars, so I created a Jinjutsu similar to Tsunada's that covers my scars and can't be released unless the flow of chakra is stopped. And that is unlikely to happen because I use Kayubi's chakra to substantiate. Naruto couldn't help but smirk at the collective gasp of the council. 
You can control the Kyuubi's chakra? Shikaku asked as his head shot up again. This was the kind of information he was looking for. If the boy could actively use the Kyuubi's chakra, then Shikaku could use him in frontline battles and never have to worry about him getting tired or dying of chakra exhaustion. Well to a certain extent yes. Naruto said as he stroked his chin. I can only control so much, but I can also call on it whenever I feel like it. The blonde mentally counted to three before someone yelled. He has full control of the Kyuubi, we need to kill him now before he uses the Kyuubi's power to kill us all. The old man at the sand I may's side said while glaring daggers at the boy. Do you really think it is a good idea to try to kill me when I have full control of the demon? Naruto asked with a raised eyebrow. I could let the Kyuubi out whenever I want to, but you damn fools still try to threaten to kill me. At this thought most of the council paled considerable. Very funny Naruto-kun. The sand I may said quickly before one of the council members did something they would regret. New question. He said changing the very hostile subject. I was wondering about the canisters on your back. Tsu asked as she stared at the three water bodas that were strapped to the teen's back. She had gotten a glimpse of the kanji on each of them, but she couldn't think of what they could mean. Unless the boy had a sword and shield sealed in two of them and then some magical curse in the other. These, Naruto said pointing to his back and pausing to build anticipation. Our secret. He said causing the council members and the Hokage to sweat drop again. We demand that you tell Yus what they contain. The old women at the Hokage's side yelled. And I demand that you go to hell. Naruto said without missing a beat. What these bodas contain are a clan secret. So unless the rest of the clans here are willing to show me the secrets of all of your clan jutsu, which they won't do, so I won't show you either. Can you at least give us a brief summary Naruto-kun? The Sandai Mei asked. I am quite curious about what they contain myself. Naruto's head dropped in defeat, there was no way that he could deny the Sandai Mei's will. Basically sword will kill you, shield will protect you, and curse will make you wish that you were in hell. Naruto summarized as best he could without revealing the secrets to his technique. Thank you Naruto-kun. The Sandai Mei said with a small smile. Go to hell monkey. Naruto said back with his bottom lip placed in a pout. Most of the council members turned to the Hokage to see what he would do to the boy for being so disrespectful, but they only found him smiling like an old grandfather to the boy. Is that all of the questions because I have to get back to Toad and Catfish? There is one more thing we need to discuss with you Naruto-san. Hiyashi Hayuga said. And what would that be? Naruto asked suspiciously. He didn't like the way that some of the council was smiling. We need to give you a rank. He ashy said allowing a small smirk to form on his face. Naruto raised one eyebrow before answering like it was obvious. Jonan. The old man at the sand I may's side chuckled darkly as he sat up in his seat. You might think you are that strong, but we will need you to take a test to prove it. The old man said with a devious smirk. It was then that Naruto figured that this was the council's plan as the sand I may called it. And what test would you have me take? Naruto asked with a raised eyebrow. We were thinking a tournament. Hiyashi said. Similiar to that of the Chunin exams. You will fight one of each rank starting with a Jenin then, if you win of course, you will go on to Chunin then Jonin. If you get through all three of them then you will become a Jonin. Naruto let out a small HHMM before asking. When would this test take place? We wouldn't want you to wait so we will start it in two hours. Hiyashi said. And who would I fight? Jenin Niji Hayuga, Chunin Mizuki, and Jonin Mikuro Dazaki. The old man next to the sand I may answered. Do Kyuubi haters and a boy that Hashi controls. The Sandai Mei thought as he smiled to himself. He already knew that the council was planning to have Niji and Mizuki tire the boy out and then have Mikuro kill him, but Hiruzen had other plans for who the Jonin would be. Even though it really didn't matter for Naruto would beat everyone the council sent against him. The Sandai Mei still wanted to know just how good the boy was, so he was going to have to change the Jonin to someone he knew would test the boy. That is a good group of shinobi, but I believe that I have someone better to fill the Jonin spot. The Sandai Mei said catching everyone's attention. I'm going to switch Mikuro Dazaki with Kakashi Haddock. Naruto couldn't help but stare at the old man with a what-the-fuck expression. Why would he make him fight one of the only people he actually liked in this village? Let's see what you have planned old monkey. Naruto thought to himself. Okage-sama I extremely hope that you will reconsider. The old woman next to him said with a pleading look. We choose those three shinobi because we felt that they would be the best suited to test the boy's abilities. The Sandai Mei couldn't help but smile as he answered. Test the boy or kill him. He asked causing a few of the councilmen to pale at being caught by the Hokage. I do agree with them about the test, so we will all meet at the arena for the test in two hours. Send a message to all of our free shinobi to come and watch if they please. But civilians will not be allowed to watch. Naruto nodded in agreement with the plan. At least this way he would get a good warm-up before his shinobi career started, and he has always wanted to fight no eye. 
Will that be all monkey-sama? Naruto asked with some respect. Yes that will be all. The sand I may said as he motioned for the anbu to unlock the boy. No need. The boy said as he snapped his wrist apart, causing the cuffs to fall apart into many different pieces. Naruto gave a small HHMMPH as he looked at the metal pieces. Kiri's cuffs are a lot stronger. He said as he turned and walked out of the room leaving the stunned counselors staring at the metal pieces. Damn. Tsum said pretty much summing up the thoughts of the other counselors. It was no secret that those cuffs could even hold Tsuna Day of the Sanin, and she was supposed to be one of the strongest shinobi in the world. X X X X X X X X X. Sushi stand. One hour later. Are you done yet Brad? Jiraiya asked as he looked at his almost empty wallet with a nine tears running down his face. Not even close grandpa. Isarabi said with a large smile as she ordered another plate of sushi. Both turned as a blonde boy sat down at the table next to Isarabi. He instantly reached for one of Isarabi's sushi, but before he touched it, she smacked his hand away with a hiss. Go away Nai-chan. Isarabi yelled as she covered her food with her arms. De calm down catfish-chan I was only kidding. Naruto said as he took a bite out of the sushi he had stolen when she smacked his hand. H how did you get that? Isarabi asked with a stunned expression. Naruto smiled as he moved his finger in a circle, causing the water from Isarabi's drink to expand from the cup and pick up one of her sushi, before moving it to Naruto's now empty palm. He smiled as he popped it into his mouth and chewed happily. That's how. He stated happily. That's not fair. Isarabi whined causing Naruto and Jiraiya to laugh at her expense. Don't laugh at me. She yelled before turning away from them and crossing her arms with a hump. Shouldn't you be at the academy Isaribi-san? A white-haired man with one eye covered by his hit I ate, said as he sat down in the remaining seat at the table. The Kashi kun what are you doing here? Jiraiya asked as he took a sip of sake. I came to talk to Naruto-kun about the test. Kakashi said as he snatched a shushi from Isarabi who started to yell about mean old men and stupid older brothers. What test? Jiraiya asked, his curiosity getting the better of him. The council is making me take a test to see what rank I should be. I fight a Hyuga Genin, some random Chunin, and no eye here. Naruto said gesturing to the one-eyed man that sweat dropped at his name. You do know that I have an eye under the hit I ate, right? Kakashi asked as he pointed to his covered eye. Whatever you say no eye. Naruto said completely ignoring the Jonin. Gureya not wanting to listen to the two argue quickly changed the subject. Do you know who the Chunin is Kakashi-kun? He asked. His name is Mizuki he is a Chunin Academy instructor along with Iruka Yamino. Kakashi paused when he thought he saw Irabi's drink shake violently, but as quick as it came it was gone. He is an average Chunin who will probably never reach Jonin rank, but one thing I do know is that he is a major Kayubi hater. Kakashi finished. Gureya let out a small sigh as he caught on to the council's plan. Have you figured it out yet? He asked Naruto who was staring at the cup of water in front of him. Gureya opened his mouth to ask again when the blonde didn't answer, but Naruto beat him to it. They are hoping that the Hyuga will tire me out enough so the Chunin can kill me. They had mostly likely planned for the Jonin to finish me off if Mizuki failed to. That's why Monkey Jiji made no eye the Jonin I have to fight. Naruto answered without looking away from the water. Will you be able to beat Mizuki? Kakashi asked with a hint of worry in his voice. You shouldn't worry about me no eye. Naruto said as he finally made eye contact with the man. You're the one that is going to need to prepare. He finished with a look of complete seriousness that sent a small chill down Kakashi's spine. I think I'll be fine. Kakashi said as he shook of the chill and pulled his little orange book out and began reading. Kakashi. Jiraiya called catching the man's attention. If you don't take him seriously, you will get your ass handed to you. Kakashi nodded as he turned back to his book and acted like he was reading when he was really focused on the blonde in front of him. For Jiraiya to be so serious about the boy shows that I shouldn't underestimate him. Kakashi thought to himself. I think it's time that I break out the Anbu gear once again. Kakashi thought as he stood from the table giving a short goodbye he disappeared in a swirl of leaves. It was time that he got serious. What are you going to do about the test? Jiraiya asked after a moment of silence. Naruto briefly looked at Isarabi before he answered. Beat them all so I can get to the highest rank possible. Which means I will need your help after I get done with no eye. Naruto said turning his attention to the perverted sage. So that's what you've been planning? Jiraiya asked as he caught on to the waterbender's plan. It's the only way I can make sure that no one can control me. Or her. Naruto whispered at the end so only Jiraiya could hear. Does here is Insane know? Jiraiya asked. No. Naruto answered without pause. If my plan works I want to make sure that he is able to deny any involvement in it to make sure the villagers don't think he is favoring me. Naruto paused for a second before adding. Which also means that I will need you to go all out. Against you? 
Jiraiya asked with a smile. Always. The fight starts soon. Naruto commented as he stood up. Make sure Isarabi sits next to woodcutter Monkey Jiji. Naruto said as he messed his sister's hair up. Hey. She yelled in protest. Don't do that to me. I'm not a child anymore. She complained as she tried to fix her hair. P. Only trust the people that I have meet. Naruto said as he turned serious. I know that you are strong enough to take care of yourself, but there are still a couple shinobi stronger than you. Always remember that no matter how strong you get, there is always someone stronger. Isarabi nodded at her Nai Santa show she understood before he walked out of the restaurant to prepare for the fights that would start soon. Can I have more sushi? Isarabi asked with puppy dog eyes which almost caused Jiraiya to say yes. Maybe after the fights. Jiraiya said as he threw money on the table before standing up with Isarabi following him. Let's go find Yamato-san before the fights begin. The toad salmon said as he grabbed onto Isarabi's shoulder before they disappeared in a swirl of wind and leaves. X X X X X X X X X X X. 30 minutes later. Chunin exam arena. The Chunin exam arena was filled with curious shinobi of all ranks. They had only been told that some kid was being tested by the council to see what rank he deserved. Many rumors were going through the crowd about who the kid was and where he came from. Some said he was a boy that had escaped from the land of water after Kirianbu had killed his family. Others said that he was a boy that had come from a royal family in Tsukakur and that he had come here after his family had cast him away. There was also a small rumor that it was the Kayubi boy who had disappeared a few years ago, but no one believed that. Up in the Kage box the Hokage sat with Yureya at his side and the council around him. Their attention was currently on the two shinobi that stood in the middle of the arena. Niji Hayuga and Mizuki stood side by side with identical scowls on their faces. Where is Kakashi-kun and Naruto-kun? The Sandai Mei asked from his chair. Kakashi is in the stands with some of the other Janoin. Jiraiya answered as he pointed to where Kakashi was talking with Asuma, Karinia, Anko, Yamato, and Isarabi. And Naruto is up there waiting for you to start the fights. Jiraiya said pointing to a small figure that was sitting on top of the wall directly across from them. Okage-sama I think it would be good to start the fight soon. Inoichi Yamanaka suggested as he looked over the shinobi that were present for the fight. Anyone who is coming has shown up, with the exception of a few Anbu. Yes I believe you are correct. The sand I may agreed as he stood to address his shinobi. Shinobi of Konoha. X X X X X X X X X X X A few minutes earlier. With the Jonin. Purin I and Asuma silently gossiped about the boy who was going to be tested in only a short while. Next to the Manko and Yamato talked in hushed tones with a girl with bandages over a good 90% of her body. I heard the boy is from the land of water. Kurin I suggested. I heard he's from Awagakur. Asuma said as he lit a cigarette. They're both wrong. Anko said as she stopped talking with Yamato and Isarabi. And how would you know? Kurin I asked her longtime friend with an eyebrow raised. Anko gave them a wide smile that just screamed I know something that you don't. I know because he is going to be in a team consisting of Yamato-kun and myself. Anko said with a hint of superiority in her voice. Why would he be put in a team with you too? Asuma asked suspiciously. It was no secret that not many Konohanins like to work with the two nin. Fears of the two turning on their teams before joining Orochimaru plagued the hearts of the shinobi and civilians. Which further increased the question about why this new boy would be put on a team with the two village pariahs. He is like us. Yamato answered cryptically, further supporting the two nin's curiosity. Before Asuma and Kurinai could interrogate the two about what they knew, Kakashi appeared in a swirl of leaves. All four of the Jonins had to do a double take at the man before they realized exactly what he was wearing and how he was acting. He had forgotten his Jonin outfit instead he wore the customary Anbu gear without the mask. He had a tanto strapped to the small of his back with two pouches filled with kunai, shuriken, and other shinobi equipment. His itcha itcha was nowhere in sight which Kurinai noticed almost instantly, instead of being happy that the perv had finally found the manners to not read his porn in public, she found that it actually scared her. This was a completely different Kakashi, a serious Kakashi. The only thing that hadn't changed was his hisha eight and his no-fingered gloves. Kakashi. You look like you are getting ready to go to war. Asuma said after getting over his shock. Something like that. Kakashi answered as he looked up at the wall where he could barely make out the form of a teen. What do you mean Kakashi? Kurinai asked catching the copycat's attention. I'm the jonin that has to fight the boy. Answered like it was common knowledge. Niji Hayuga is the jonin. Mizuki is the chunin and I'm the jonin. As he said each name the four jonin's eyes widened. Who did the boy piss off? Asuma asked as he tried to figure out the reason that his father would put some boy against the best jonin, chunin, and jonin of the village. It wasn't the boy that pissed anyone off. 
Yamato said as he watched Aisarabi mess with a scroll she had pulled from her pouch. It was the Kayubi and Arachimaru. He finished as realization came to the two jonin as they turned to the arena, just as the Hokage stood to address them all. Naruto watched as the arena filled with the many different shinobi of Konoha. He couldn't help but notice how each clan and rank had separated themselves from the rest of their comrades. He wasn't sure if they were doing this on purpose or if it was just how things happened here in Konoha. Together but separated. Naruto mumbled to himself as he looked to his little sister that was playing with one of her scrolls with wood cut at her side. Did. Kayubi asked as he opened their mental link so he could talk to the boy. What? Naruto asked as he leaned back against the wall. When are you going to get a summon? Kayubi asked randomly. You're going to need one soon if you are still planning to take out the snake in the next year. Naruto mentally slapped himself as he had indeed forgotten about getting a summon. He would need all of his strength to kill the immortal snake, energy that he would have to use on killing Manda, unless he could summon his own animal to take care of Manda as he killed the pedophile. I'll have to go to the land of water after this is taken care of. Naruto thought to himself. Now that I don't have to worry about Catfish-chan, I can finally get the contract. We can also check on Kiri to see how the ginger is doing as Kage. Kayubi added with a hint of hope in his voice that made Naruto grin evilly. The ginger? Naruto asked like he didn't know who the fox was talking about. After a brief pause he snapped his fingers together before a look of realization spread across his face. Oh you're referring to Kai Tenshi, Blood Angel. Naruto thought using the nickname Kayubi had given the Kage of Kiri. He snickered to himself as Kayubi started sputtering incoherently. Naruto cancelled the link with the Kayubi as the Hokage stood up to address the gathered shinobi. Shinobi of Konoha. The sand I made began with a demanding and strong voice. It seemed that the tournament was about to begin. Shinobi of Konoha I welcome you were today to watch history in the making. For on this day we will welcome one of our own into our ranks. The sand I made spoke with such authority in his voice that every person there believed what he spoke of. He will one day lead us into a great future, a future of peace, power, and freedom. Please give a good welcome to Naruto Uzumaki container of the Kayubi and controller of water. As the Hokage finished his speech Naruto appeared in front of Mizuki and Niji in a swirl of water. His appearance was met with silence and shock. This was the boy that was thought to have been dead for the past few years. This was the boy that they had feared for so long. And now he stood in front of all of them with his arms crossed and power radiating off of him. Before the inevitable outcry from the crowd could start a jonin with a senbin in his mouth, appeared in between the three men. Mizuki moved to the competitor's box so we can begin the first match. The jonin ordered. Mizuki sneered at the blonde before jumping away towards the competitor's box to wait for his turn. But Mizuki gone the jonin turned to the remaining two men who were currently starring at each other. This match will go until one of you either surrenders or is knocked out. Anything goes, but we ask that neither of you use any assassination techniques. We are all comrades after all. The jonin said loud enough for everyone to hear. Are you ready? He asked getting a nod from both boys he raised his hand high above his head. Fight. He yelled as his hand dropped before jumping away to avoid getting caught in the crossfire. Niji wasted no time as he moved forward in impressive speeds for a genin. The Hayuga prodigy wanted to finish this as quickly as possible so he could finally attain his dream. He struck fast with a palm strike to the blonde's chest, who was still staring at him without a care in the world. Niji's arm fully extended and he waited for the customary feeling of his palm striking flesh, but he came up short when his palm stopped a good five inches away from the other boy. He, along with the crowd, openly gaped at the boy's palm. Hayuga were known for not missing their targets, yet the Hayuga prodigy himself had just came up short by a good five to six inches from a target that hadn't even moved. Or so they thought. Is that all you got Branch-san? Naruto asked with a small smirk as he stared up at the sky where a small blue jay was flying above them. He loved to watch those colorful little birds fly through the sky, they always seemed so peaceful. What did you call me? Niji asked as he moved back into his stance. His eyes were narrowed dangerously as he glared at his opponent. You heard me Branch-san. Naruto answered with his smirk never leaving his face. He knew that all branch members of the Hayuga clan were usually very sore when it came to them being in the branch family. And from the way the older boy was glaring, he knew that he had hit a nerve and he was going to keep hitting it if it meant that he would become sloppy with his movements from anger and rage. How dare you insult me you damn demon. Niji roared as he activated his famous bloodline and stared to thrust his hands at the blonde's chest, but with each strike, Naruto would simple step back or around them. Niji grew more and more angry as the blonde dodged every single one of his attacks like it was nothing. He let a sinister smile spread across his face when one of his palm thrusts connected right above the blonde's heart. Like I said before. Is that all you got Branch-san? Naruto asked with a smart-ass smile, the blow he received seemingly not affecting him. 
Niji let out a loud growl as he moved back into a deeper stance than his original. You're within my field of devastation. Niji called out as he moved forward to hit the blonde with one of the Hyuga's strongest attacks. Two strikes. He called hitting the blonde in the chest twice. Four strikes. Niji noticed that the blonde wasn't even attempting to dodge a single strike, which caused him to be weary at first, but if the blonde wasn't going to fight, then Niji would just finish him quickly. 8 strikes. 16 strikes. 32 strikes. 64 strikes. 128 strikes. The finally strike connected sending Naruto back almost 15 yards before here all to a stop. Everyone watched with their breaths held, each one waiting to see if the blonde would get up. Almost a full minute passed before Niji let out a deep breath that he didn't know he was holding. He stood with a triumphant smile on his face, as looked up towards the Kage's box was. His eyes scanned the box until they fell on Hiashi, who was gave him subtle nod. Niji bowed before Hiashi in one of the many dark hallways that the arena held. He knew that two branch members stood at the entrance to each hallway to make sure no one overheard this conversation. You will be fighting a demon that has disgraced Konoha since the day he was born. Hiashi spoke gaining Niji's undivided attention. It is supposed to be a match to first knock out or surrender, but I want you to kill the demon filth. If you are able to kill him I will strip Hinata of her title as clan heir and reward it to you. Niji let out an involuntary gasp at this. No branch member has ever been allowed to enter the main branch before. If they were willing to let him become a main branch and clan heir, then this mission must be really important. I will do as you ask. Niji answered with the calm that all Hyuga should have. But because if you fail to kill him. Hiashi left the threat hanging as he walked away to join the rest of the clan heads and Hokage at the Kage's box. Niji was brought out of his thoughts by a loud gasp from the crowd. He quickly turned back to where his fallen opponent should have been laying, but instead, he came face to face with the blonde. A brief look showed that the blonde didn't even look like he had been hit, hell he was even smiling at him. Niji jumped away to gain some distance from the blonde so he could come up with a new battle strategy. Not bad Branch-san, but your Tejutsu won't work on me. Naruto yelled out as he flashed a small portion of his chakra to show that he still has complete control of his chakra pathways. You're going to need to try harder than that if you are going to gain your freedom. Niji's eyes almost popped out of his head. Don't look so surprised Branch-san. Not all of your members are loyal to the Hayuga. Especially if you consider how most of them are treated. If you know what Haishi-sama has offered then you know that I must kill you today. Niji said as he slipped back into his stance, but Naruto could see that the he had lost a lot of his determination. I can't allow you to kill me, but I might be able to help you. Naruto offered a small smile towards the trouble prodigy. Now let's move on with our match shall we? And remember, your tojutsu won't work on me so you should try some ninjutsu. And when I say ninjutsu I mean elemental, not that glorified tea ninjutsu your family uses. I don't need elemental ninjutsu to beat you. Niji spat at the blonde as he prepared to charge once more. We shall see. Naruto dropped to one knee with both of his palms on the ground. Come on then branch san. Naruto taunted with a smirk. Niji ran at the blonde with a snarl, his hand pulled back to strike at the other boy. Naruto smiled as he pumped some chakra into the ground. Niji watched as two dragons made of mud extruded from the ground. Balls of mud shot from dragons' mouths at Niji, causing him to jump back to escape the heavy attacks. You can't dodge forever Branch-san. Naruto yelled, passing more chakra into the ground, causing two more dragons to pop out of the ground. Niji let out a small curse when the dragons began shooting mud ball after mud ball. He dodged as many as he could, but he was running out of room and energy. He stopped as all four of the dragons shot one last mud ball at the same time, taking a deep breath Niji focused on all of his chakra points. Just as the mud balls were closing in on him he began to spin and expelled his chakra from each of his points. A trigram's palms heavenly spin. Niji's voice yelled behind the dome of spinning chakra. The mud balls were thrown away harmlessly by the spinning ball of chakra that stopped soon after showing an arrogant Niji. His confidence and smile fell when he saw Naruto in the same position, only now there were four more dragon heads. Let's see how many more times you can pull that incomplete jutsu off. Naruto called out as the dragons reared their heads back to fire again. Damn it. Niji cursed at having to use the heavenly spin again, along with Naruto, seeing that it wasn't complete yet. Only a few people could tell that the spin wasn't fast enough, and his back was extremely weak and easily broken if someone hit it hard enough. Not getting much more time to think Niji activated his jutsu once again as the dragons shot another round of mud balls at him. Just like before the mud balls bounced off harmlessly only this time when Niji stopped spinning, everyone could see some mud on his body, showing that the jutsu was weak enough to let some mud break through. Not bad Branch-san, but you are at your end. Naruto gave the boy a small smile that only served to piss him off, but he soon paled when another four dragons appeared and reared their heads back just like the others. 
They fired at once creating a long line of mud balls. The Hyuga prodigy once again started his heavenly spin, but before it only withstood three hits before the jutsu broke and he was overcame by mud balls that pinned him to the ground on his back by his hands, feet and neck. Niji could only listen as Naruto's footsteps got closer and closer. Tell me where you went wrong Niji. Naruto ordered, using the boy's name to get his full attention. I underestimated you. Niji answered without hesitation as he allowed his bloodline to deactivate and stare towards the sky. Wrong. You over-specialized in your training. Naruto replied as he crouched next to the boy's head so Niji could see him. All of your arrogant ass clan specializes in your tojutsu, and one day it will be your downfall. You must remember that even the strongest of techniques can be defeated, so you must never rely on only one thing. Do as your name implies and branch out. Learn different techniques and become better than those elders that place that seal on your head. Why should I listen to you? Niji spat out at the blonde, not wanting to listen to what he had to say. You're a year younger than me, what gives you the right to lecture me? He yelled completely losing control of his emotions. I might be younger than you, but believe me when I tell you that I know what I speak of. Naruto looked away from him with a small smile on his face. I almost died once because I relied too much on my control of water. I was lucky that the women that beat me allowed me to live and learn for my mistakes. And now I am giving you a chance to learn from your mistake. Come and find me after this is all done, and I will help you branch out and learn new things that will allow you to become stronger. Naruto stood and stretched his back, causing a few pops to be heard. Snapping his fingers the mud around Niji fell away from his skin and sank into the ground. The Hyuga prodigy sat up rubbing his hands and feet. None of this matters, Hiyashi-sama will kill me as soon as I step foot into the compound. Niji stood with his head down and his eyes closed. He knew that Hiyashi would activate his seal as soon as he was in the compound where no one could interfere. Not if I have anything to say about it. Who's your Jonin sensei? Naruto asked, his eyes scanning the crowd for someone. White guy. Niji answered trying to figure out what the other boy had planned. Aye. The blonde yelled out to the crowd of ninja. His eyes locked onto a man in a green jumpsuit who stood up when his name was called. Naruto motioned for the man to come down to them, guy only hesitated for a second before appearing before the two boys. Naruto noticed that he didn't use a jutsu to appear before them, he was using pure speed. Not bad. Naruto thought to himself. Naruto your fight with my student was most youthful. The man yelled with his fist thrust into the air. Naruto sweat dropped as his eyebrow twitched. Okay then. He drawled out getting the two shinobi's attention. I need you to take your student to a safe place until after the fights. That way I will have enough time to talk to the old monkey before he ashi has a chance to do anything. Where should I take him? Guy asked completely serious now. The Hokage's office. Tell the Anbu that Niji is in danger that no one is allowed in the office until the old monkey gets there. Guy nodded and without question grabbed his student's arm and shunshin them away from the arena. Naruto turned to his right just as the jonin with a senbin in his mouth appeared next to him. Where did they go? He asked in a lazy tone. Naruto looked at him blankly before shrugging. Well that explains it. His voice was filled with sarcasm. Smart ass. Naruto called back before walked back to the center of the arena. Start the next match. He called back over his shoulder. Yeah, yeah will Mizuki come down to the arena please? He called out to the crowd. Mizuki wasted no time by appearing in front of Naruto with a glare filled with hatred. Okay the rules are the same, are you ready? Both shinobi nodded. Then let the fight begin. He disappeared again leaving the two shinobi to stare at each other. You die here today demon. Mizuki sneered at the blonde boy. You really think you're strong enough to kill me, Chunin? Naruto asked skeptically. This man felt wrong to Naruto, something wasn't right, but he couldn't place it. Do you smell that? The Kayubi asked from the back of his mind. Naruto answered by taking a deep breath, only to have to stop himself from gagging. He smells of snake. A bitter taste filled Naruto's mouth as he glared at the Chunin. This man was allying himself with all the wrong people, and Naruto was going to kill him for it. I'm more than strong enough to kill you. Mizuki said as he pulled out a kunai that had a purple tint to it. Naruto instantly recognized the poison that covered the blade. The hidden scars that covered his body made themselves known with a searing pain. You will die today. Naruto told the man as he finally showed the crow his ability to control water by forming to thick tentacles around his arms. The water moving with his arms perfectly. Control yourself kit. If you kill him too quickly the council will attempt to charge you with killing a felon in. The Kayubi called from the back of his mind. Naruto mental nodded as he closed his eyes and took a deep breath to calm himself. If he was going to kill Mizuki then he would need to get some sort of evidence to show Mizuki's loyalty to that pedophile of a snake. A small smile formed on his face when his eyes came into contact with the poison kunai. We shall see about that demon scum. 
Mizuki taunted throwing the poison kunai with as much strength as he had. Naruto flickered away from sight before appearing behind the white-haired Chunin. Naruto slapped the Chunin away with a tentacle, sending him to the arena wall with a loud thud. Slow. Naruto commented before thrusting his arms towards the down Chunin. A large jet of water shot from his hand, slamming the Chunin back into the wall with enough force to crack the cement. Damn you. Mizuki growled picking himself up from the ground holding his ribs. He ran through a few hand signs before bringing his fist up to his mouth. Fire release. Fireball jutsu. The Chunin yelled before shooting a medium-sized fireball at the waterbender. Naruto moved through his own hand signs before slamming his hands onto the ground. Mud release. Raging Rhino. The blonde yelled as a large rhino made of mud exploded from the ground charging at the fireball. The two attacks met with an explosion that filled the area with smoke. Mizuki cursed as he jumped away just as the rhino appeared from the smoke ramming his horn into the wall, causing it to crack and crumble even more. Mizuki rolled away from his jump throwing three kunai as the blonde who simple knocked them away with one of his tentacles. Naruto moved the water around his arms to form into a large ball above his head. Slicing his hand down the ball split before the blonde kicked one half at Mizuki, who rolled to the right, but before he could regain his footing, the second half of the ball slammed into him, sending him back to the center of the arena. Is this all you got, Chunin? Naruto asked with a smirk as he slowly walked towards the Chunin who was standing up again. I'll show you demon. Mizuki snarled pulling another poison kunai that he instantly threw at the blonde. Naruto knew this was the time to move, so he allowed the kunai to grace his arm. The effects were instant as the poison began to burn his skin and disrupt the Kyuubi's chakra, causing his Jinjutsu to drop and his scars to appear. A loud gasp was heard throughout the crowd as they took in Naruto's many scars that covered his arms, his visible chest, and the small scar on the right side of his mouth. Naruto smiled at Mizuki's stunned expression. What's wrong Chunin? Did Orochimaru team tell you that the poison would kill me? Mizuki in his stunned expression answered truthfully. He told me you would die when the poison entered your system. Naruto moved before the Chunin could react. Disappearing and reappearing behind the Chunin quickly created a large amount of water that wrapped around the stunned Chunin, who could do nothing but watch helplessly as he was brought to his knees. His attempts to escape were useless as the water compacted and held him in place in front of the blonde, who was now looking up towards the Kage's box. What should we do with this traitor? Naruto asked yelled to the aged Hokage that was glaring at the white-haired man. Anbu take him to Ibiki. The Sandaime answered instantly. Everyone watched as three Anbu appeared in between Naruto and Mizuki, but everyone noticed that the three Anbu weren't looking at Mizuki, they were looking at Naruto. You would turn your back to a traitor. Naruto asked while glaring at the three Anbu that had taken a defensive stance before the blonde. We would rather have our backs to a traitor than a demon. The lead Anbu snarled. The Anbu moved like he was going to do something, but before he could take his first step, he found himself pinned to the ground just like Mizuki. Before the Naruto could do anything else three more Anbu appeared, but now they stood at his side facing the traitors. We will take it from here Naruto-kun. The head Anbu said as his two teammates slapped chakra repressing cuffs on the downed Anbu and Chunin. Thank you for your assistance Naruto-kun. He said before they all disappeared in a shunshin. Well that was interesting. Naruto said to himself before walking back to the center of the arena. He looked forward as Kakashi appeared in full Anbu gear including his Tanto. I hope you aren't too tired from fighting those two. Kakashi said slipping into his tojutsu stance. Naruto smirked at the older man. Not even close. He said falling into his own stance. Are you ready for this? Kakashi asked pulling his tanto from his back. I won't hold back. Naruto nodded taking the blue blade less hilt form his pants. Neither will I. He answered before sending chakra to the hilt. Everyone in the arena gasped as a long stream of yellow lightning expanded from the hilt, creating of the blade. Let's begin. Should I even ask how you got that sword? Kakashi asked while inspecting the Nidaime's famous weapon. He knew the story of how it was taken and how Aoi had gotten it, but he hadn't heard anything about Aoi being killed, and killing him was the only way to get the weapon. Some fool thought he could match my water with lightning. Naruto answered inspecting the sword with a smirk. He didn't win. Kakashi chuckled lightly. Obviously. He brought his own tanto out in front of him for everyone to see. It seems I will have to activate this a little sooner than expected. He said before sending chakra to his own blade making a pure white chakra coat the blade. Another round of gasps were heard from the crowd as they stared at the two legendary swords. Your father's white chakra blade? Naruto asked. Kakashi gave the boy a eye smile with a small nod. I was under the impression that it had been destroyed. Kakashi nodded again, but the smile was gone. Yes, well that's the good thing about swords. They can always be repaired if broken. I guess you're right. Naruto answered crouching slightly with his left foot towards Kakashi and his left hand forward with his right hand, which wielded the sword resting near his face. 
It's about time that we started this, don't you think? Bakashi nodded lifting his hit IA to uncover his Sharingan before falling into his own stance with his right foot forward and his sword out angled across his face in a defensive position with his left hand cocked back and near his stomach. They exploded forward at the same time meeting in the middle with their swords crossed. Each pushed to gain some form of dominance, but neither could gain the upper hand. Kakashi gave one more push before spinning away and slashing at the blonde's feet. Naruto formed a small shield of water at his feet to block the strike as he lashed out with his own blade at Kakashi's shoulder. Bakashi rolled to his right to dodge the lightning blade before jumping away throwing two kunai in the air. Naruto deflected both kunai by throwing his own water kunai. The blonde stared at Kakashi for a few seconds before turning into water and dropping to the ground in a small splash. Bakashi looked around widely trying to find the blonde, but even with his Sharingan, he could find no trace of the boy. He never sensed the water bender until it was too late and he was caught on the side of the head by the shorter boy's foot sending him into the air. Using the momentum from the kick to flip around and bring his tanto up just in time to block Naruto's blade. Then using his longer legs to kick the blonde away from him and gain some room to move. I'm going to have to take this up a notch. Kakashi said to himself before running through hand seals. Fire release. Flame bullet. Kakashi yelled bringing his fist up to his mouth and filling his mouth with oil created by his chakra before shooting a boulder-sized ball of fire at the blonde. Naruto smiled at the man before running through his own set of hand signs. Earth release. Earth style wall. Naruto yelled before shooting mud out of his mouth that hardened quickly and created a strong wall. The flame bullet exploded against the wall sending flaming oil around the area. The wall of now flaming earth fell apart to reveal a smiling Naruto. The Toad used that same technique on me once, but I made the mistake of shooting a water bullet at it. Naruto explained. When it exploded the oil covered most of my body, it hurt like hell, but I learned a valuable lesson that day. It seems you will also learn the lesson today. Kakashi said before disappearing and reappearing behind the blonde with his tanto at the blonde's neck. Never drop your guard. Kakashi let a small smile grace his lips for a split second before it dropped when the blonde snickered. I never do. Naruto answered honestly before he exploded into water showing that he was a water clone. Kakashi turned just in time to block the blonde container's blade from electrocuting him. Allow me to show you why the land of water called my weapon Poseidon's trident. Naruto said as he added more chakra to his blade. Bakashi watched with wide eyes as the lightning expanded, covering the hilt in the process, but it didn't seem to bother the blonde. The lightning expanded until it was as tall as the blonde, with a three-pronged spearhead reaching to just above his head. Bakashi was not willing to be so close to the blonde while he wielded weapon, so he quickly jumped back to gain some room to move, but Naruto gave him little, as he jumped with Kakashi and thrust the trident into Kakashi's head, causing the man to duck, only to be hit by Naruto's knee. The waterbender gave him no time to defend himself as he slammed the older man with a large fist of water that sent Kakashi high into the air. Not wanting to the lose the advantage Naruto ran through a few hand seals. Water release. Water dragon whip. A large ball of water formed in front of him. He quickly touched it with his trident sending lightning currents through the water before the many whips shot out of the ball towards the still airborne Kakashi. The whips closed the distance with Kakashi quickly, but just as they were about to hit their target they were redirected to behind Naruto. Don't ever use my own element against me no I. Naruto said throwing a water kunai that pierced the airborne Kakashi through the neck causing him to explode into water. Kakashi cursed where he was hiding in a tree that was behind Naruto. He was losing too much chakra and it seemed like Naruto wasn't even tired yet. He was going to have to go all out for the next few minutes if he was going to come away victories. But first he needed to take care of those whips that were getting closer to him. He quickly ran through a few of his own hand seals before calling out. Lightning release. False darkness. A large bolt of lightning shot out of Kakashi's covered mouth, the lightning bolt raced on forward for a few seconds before expanding into smaller bolts that met the water whips head-on, causing a large explosion to cover the area in between the two shinobi. That's never good. Naruto muttered to himself before stopping the flow of chakra to his trident, causing it to become the normal blue hilt again. He placed it in his pants before crouching down and waiting for either Kakashi to attack or the smoke from the explosion to clear. Naruto's eyes widened when a large hound made of lightning burst through the smoke and rushed him with a high-pitched roar. The blonde quickly jumped to the left to dodge the attack, but it proved useless as the hound followed him. Naruto cursed doing a few quick hand seals. Wind release. Great breakthrough. The blonde yelled shooting a large gust of wind at the hound. The hound dropped his head and rammed the large gust of wind, the two attacks struggled for a few seconds before the hound was finally blown away, causing the attack to stop. HMPH, it's still too weak. Naruto said referring to the only wind technique he had. I was hoping you didn't have any wind techniques. 
Kakashi called out from where the smoke had finally blown away with the help of the boy's wind. The older man was panting slightly from using so much chakra in that last attack, but he couldn't stop now. That was my only one actually. Naruto told him truthfully, finding no real reason to lie about it. You look a little tired no I. He commented taking in the silver-haired man's appearance. Yes well I haven't been pushed this hard in a long time. Kakashi answered standing straight and trying to gain his second wind. Naruto gave him a sinister smirk. Well I guess I will have to finish this quickly. He said before reaching to his back and opening both the sword and shield boda bags. The water from both bags began to fall from their containers, the sword water being purple and circling the blonde's waist, with the shield water being almost metallic and circling the blonde's feet. I would recommend dodging. The blonde yelled before charging the now semi-refreshed man. Kakashi took the blonde's advice and jumped back throwing a few kunai as he did. The shield water reacted instantly moving forward and knocking the kunai away like they were flies. I'm going to have to get rid of that water. Kakashi whispered to himself before running through a few hand seals. Fire technique. Grand fireball. A boulder-sized ball of fire shot out towards the blonde who stopped and brought the shield water up to protect him again. The ball of fire connected with a wall of metallic water, creating a large explosion. The smoke cleared quickly revealing a dome of metallic water covering where the blonde was standing before. The Kashi waited for the dome to drop and the blonde to attack again, but nothing happened. Well what do I do now? Kakashi asked himself while studying the dome. Fire obviously doesn't hurt it, so all he could do was try another element. Wind might be able to cut through it, but it was more likely that it would just blow around it. Water would just move around at the dome, and that's only if Naruto doesn't take control of it first. Earth would work, but he was too low on chakra to use a strong offensive attack, and he had no doubt that it would need to be strong to break that dome. And finally lightning would just move with the water or shock the shit out of himself. What did you tell me earlier? Naruto's voice asked from directly behind him causing Kakashi to jump away, but not before being slashed across the back with that purple water. Oh yeah now I remember, never drop your guard. Naruto gave Kakashi a smug smile that confused the older man, but he soon realized why the blonde was smug when he felt his chakra begin to drain and his muscles lock up. The poison. Kakashi mumbled out before falling to his knees. Naruto nodded while walking up to the downed man, his sword and shield water returning to the bodas on his back. It's a very potent poison that drains your chakra and locks up your muscles before killing you. Naruto said as he took out a small blue vial from inside of his vest and pouring it down the man's throat. That will stop you from dying, but you will still be very weak for a day or so. The Senbin Chewing Jonin appeared before the two shinobi. Winner of the final match Naruto Uzumaki. He called out to the crow that surprisingly clapped for the blonde. Naruto smiled before giving the crow a brief bow. Two medics appeared from the stadium wall, they quickly put Kakashi on a stretcher before running off to get him to the hospital so they could make sure the poison was being stopped by the antidote. You never told me your name? Naruto said in a questioning tone as he turned to the Senbin Chewing Jonin. Genma Shiranyui. The Senbin Chewing Man answered while extending his hand towards the blonde boy. I guess you'll be joining our ranks soon. I guess you're right. Naruto answered before covering his hand with water and shaking the man's hand. Genma gave him a weird look but decided to let it go. You should go to the stands now. You don't want to get caught up in what's about to happen. Naruto warned as he looked up to the Kage's box where everyone was talking, most likely about him. What's about to happen? Genma asked the blonde container. You'll see soon enough. Naruto answered cryptically causing Hei to stare at him with a raised eyebrow. Genma opened and closed his mouth a few times as he tried to think of something to say to that, but after a few seconds just shrugged it off and began walking back to where he was sitting with the rest of the Jonin and Naruto's little sister. Naruto watched him walk away before looking back up to the Kage's box, where his eyes landed on the Toad Sanin. You all wanted to see how strong I was with this so-called test. So I'm going to show you just how strong I am. Naruto yelled out gaining everyone attention. Jiraiya of the sand and I challenge you to a duel, under the same rules as the test. A collective gasp ran through the crowd of shinobi. All of them wondering if the blonde was really so strong that he would challenge one of the sand and sound confident. In the Kage's box Jiraiya smiled from where he stood next to the Hokage, who was staring at him with calculating eyes. Jiraiya gave him a brief nod before shunshining in front of the blonde. I accept. An old man once told me that before every battle you will find the world a complete silence. So focused are the fighters on each other, that for just a moment, a second, a heartbeat, there is nothing else. Nothing except the fight. But like all silence, it is eventually broken. Are you sure you don't want to take a day to rest after your fight with Kakashi-kun? Jiraiya asked his old student. Naruto gave the old pervert a smile. Don't worry Iro Toad I still have enough chakra to beat you. Are you sure about that Naruto-kun? Jiraiya asked. 
you were never able to beat me before, and that was when you were at full strength. Things changed Jiraiya, and it has been a long time since you have seen me at my best. Naruto answered as he jumped away from Jiraiya, signaling the start of the battle. Normally Jiraiya would have pressed his student, but the use of his name caused him to hesitate long enough for Naruto to finish the seal sequence for his jutsu. Nightmare illusion. Enemy of your enemy. The Gen Jutsu's effects were instant, images of Orochimaru filled the field around Jiraiya, memories of their previous fights and missions they went on as a team passing over his eyes in a mind-buzzing haze. The images stopped just as quickly as they came, but when Jiraiya finally focused on the battlefield again Naruto had already summoned a man made of water. The toad sand and watched as the water formed into Orochimaru and his clothing from the last shinobi war. What are you doing Naruto? Jiraiya asked as his student opened his sword and shield bow to bags once more, forming the water into an ordinary sword and shield that Orochimaru quickly grasped, wielding the shield in his left hand and the sword in his right with a sickening grin on his face. Making you fight against the person that you consider your greatest enemy. Naruto said as he inspected Orochimaru, a single eyebrow raised in question. I sometimes wonder how many people I will find that will consider this fool their greatest enemy. Why? Jiraiya asked as he took a few steps away from his student and old teammate. Shouldn't I be their greatest enemy? Naruto answered before Orochimaru charged at the Toad Sanin with his purple sword posed to strike. Jiraiya blocked the strike with a kunai, but was forced to spin away from Orochimaru in order to dodge the metallic shield that would have easily cut him in half. Throwing a few shuriken at Orochimaru before running through a set of seals. Earth release. Piercing spike. A large spike exploded from the ground in front of Orochimaru in an attempt to impale him, but Orochimaru reacted quickly using the shield to block the point of the spear and his sword to cut the tip off. Is that how you treat your old teammate Jiraiya-kun? Orochimaru asked, his long tongue reaching out and licking his lips. Jiraiya's eyes narrowed as he rushed Orochimaru with a kunai in each hand. The two old teammates clashed in a flurry of blocks and strikes that neither man could land. Their movement finally stopped with Jiraiya blocking the sword and shield with his kunai and attempting to overpower the smaller man, but he found that Orochimaru was strong enough to hold his position. You have become weak Jiraiya Kun Orochimaru taunted, causing the Toad Sanin to let out a roar of anger as he gave one final push with all of his strength that proved strong enough to push the Snake Sanin to the ground. This ends here Orochi team. Jiraiya said as he thrust his kunai into the Snake Sanin's head without hesitation. Orochimaru gave Jiraiya one last smile before he burst into water, causing Jiraiya's eyes to widen as he remembered that he was fighting his student, not his old teammate. The water in front of him reacted quickly the shield water wrapping around his hand and feet with the sword water wrapping around his neck. You got distracted Jiraiya. Naruto said as he appeared behind the man with his lightning trident activated and the spikes resting on Jiraiya's spine. And you forgot about your greatest enemy. That's a nasty jutsu you have there Naruto-kun. Jiraiya commented as he regained his bearings from the fight with his old teammate, or at least a clone of his old teammate. But it's not enough to beat me. Naruto jumped away from Jiraiya just in time to dodge a rock that exploded when it hit the ground, sending shards into Jiraiya, causing him to poof into smoke. Naruto cursed under his breath as he called for his sword and shield water to cover his arms so they could be easily used. I should have figured that you would have replaced yourself with a clone as soon as the snake bastard burst. Naruto commented as he looked towards the tree line where his sensei was leaning against a tree. The blonde didn't wait for his sensei to answer as he charged at the older man with his trident posed to strike. Jiraiya jumped towards him blocking the trident from piercing his stomach with a kunai before kicking at the blonde's shoulder, but his shield water moved from his left arm to block the kick before trying to wrap around his leg, but Jiraiya was too quick and pulled his leg away. Naruto dropped to the ground and tried to sweep Jiraiya's leg out form under him, but the older man simple jumped over the boy's leg before throwing a shuriken at the blonde that was cut in half by the shield water, before being thrown back at the older man by a tentacle of water that formed from behind the blonde. Jumping away from the two shuriken halves and using a kunai to cut his thumb, Jiraiya quickly ran through a set of seals before slamming his hand against the ground, causing a large plum of smoke to cover himself. The smoke cleared to reveal Jiraiya standing on a toad the size of a horse wielding a katana in his webbed hands. Jiraiya jumped off the toad just as he launched himself at the blonde with his katana ready to strike. Naruto blocked the strike before sending a barrage of senbin made of his sword water at the toad, who simply jumped high into the air to avoid the senbin. Before Naruto could attack the airborne toad he was kicked in the head, his water being too slow to block the leg of the forgotten Sanin. Naruto cursed as he rolled with the impact of the kick, sliding to stop on one knee, his shield water moving above him just in time to block the strike from the toad. This is why we need a damn summon. The Kyuubi grumbled from the back of the blonde's mind. 
Naruto nodded in agreement as he summoned a wave of water to slam into the toad, as he blocked another kick from Jiraiya with his trident, causing a shock of lightning to go through Jiraiya's leg, electing a shout from the older man, and causing him to jump back. Jiraiya nodded towards the toad who nodded in return before his body began to swell with a large amount of oil. Jiraiya finished a sequence of seals just as the toad shot a stream of oil at the blonde. Bringing his hand to his mouth, he shot a large ball of blue flames at the oil, causing it to light up in a large stream of blazing fire that exploded in front of the blonde, who simply formed a dome of his shield water to protect him. Shit that's hot. Naruto said from the inside of his dome that currently covered in a blazing hot fire. Calling water from the air outside he quickly pushed the flames away from him and jumped out of his shield water that was red from the heat. Naruto tensed when he felt a presence behind him, but he couldn't call on any water fast enough to protect him from the barrage of punches and kicks that covered his body, Jiraiya sent a strong uppercut into the blonde's chin, causing him to be launched high into the air, where his toad was waiting and ready to kick him across the arena where he landed with a large thud. Naruto groaned in pain as he stood from the ground, his body protesting the entire way. He looked across the arena where Jiraiya stood by himself, the toad disappearing with a pop after he kicked the blonde away. Naruto knew he would need to throw everything into this next attack if he was going to win without using the Kyuubi's chakra, and he was not willing to lose, so he was going to have to use one of his strongest attacks. Standing straight and closing his eyes water began to swirl around him before lifting him high into the air. Running through a set of seals before his eyes snapped open and more water formed behind him, forming into a large wave that rose above the arena walls. Visidian's Rage. Naruto called out the name of his jutsu as the wave of water crashed forwards towards Jiraiya, who after seeing the water appear, had attempted to interrupt him, only to be too slow. The toad san and moved quickly, running through his own seals before slamming his hands onto the ground, a large dome of pure stone covered the san as his last stand of defense. That won't be strong enough Jiraiya. Naruto said to himself as he used a tentacle of water to throw his trident ahead of the roaring wave. The trident of lightning pierced deep into the stone, causing a spider web of cracks to cover the stone, before the wave crashed into it, causing the dome to shatter, and Jiraiya to be slammed into the ground before being thrown into the arena wall, creating an imprint of his body into the wall. Naruto dropped from his spiral of water before walking up to his fallen sensei, who was attempting to stand once again, but could not find the strength. Naruto lifted the older man, throwing his arm around his shoulder for support before walking towards the center of the arena. This battle is over. Naruto called out to the stunned crow that could barely comprehend that a 13-year-old boy could beat the strongest of the Sanin. Would Kun please bring Catfish Chan to the Hokage's office, I will meet you there. Yamato nodded before Naruto and Jiraiya disappeared in a swirl of water. Hokage's office. Ten minutes later. Yamato, Isoribi, Hiruzen, Anko, and the newly released Kakashi walked into the office, or limped in Kakashi's case. On the couch laid and exhausted Naruto with his arms over his eyes and a smiling Jiraiya sitting in a chair. Naruto moved one arm to look at the group before pointing to Jiraiya and covering his eyes once again. What's up with the brat? Anko asked as she moved her arm to poke the sleeping boy but was stopped by Yamato, who shook his head no. After fighting Kakashi-kun and myself without a break. Jiraiya started with a smile as he stood and stretched his tired legs. I couldn't imagine anyone not being exhausted. How are you walking right now? Yamato asked Jiraiya as everyone watched as Isoribi sat on her brother's stomach causing the boy to let out a small oof. Naruto-kun at full strength could kill me, but he was already tired from the fight with Kakashi, and he couldn't go all out without causing an uproar. So we both decided that I would lose after he showed one of his stronger attacks, so he could demonstrate some of his strength, while showing that he could take on any ninja that could be sent after him. Jiraiya said as everyone looked to where Naruto was laying, now with one of his hands running through Isoribi's long hair. Is this true Naruto-kun? Hiruzen asked. Naruto nodded without looking towards the group. I knew that eventually someone would send an assassin after me, so I wanted to show them that no one they sent would be strong enough to kill me, and that's exactly what we accomplished today. Now we just need to figure out what we are going to do about Catfish Chan. Can't you just protect me Nai-san? Isoribi asked her brother with a pout. I can, but I won't always be around to protect you, and until you're strong enough to protect yourself, we will need someone to protect you from any fools that think they can attack you while I'm not around. Naruto said as he pointed to Kakashi. You will be her sensei once she graduates the academy tomorrow with the rest of my generation. I want you to protect her while I'm gone and train her to become as strong as me when I am unable to train her. Bakashi nodded as he patted the girl's head. I live in an apartment complex that only allows active shinobi to live there. Last I checked the apartment directly next to mine is open, so we should move the both of you there so I will be able to watch her even when we aren't in a team training session. Fair enough. Naruto agreed as he finally sat up from the couch, moving Isoribi off of him in the process. 
Didn't I tell Guy to bring Niji here after my fight with the boy? He asked as he looked around the room for the duo but came up with nothing. Now that you mention it. Hiruzen said as he looked around the room for himself before moving to his desk and pressing a concealed button. An Anbu appeared in a shunshin bowing to the sand I may. Go find Guy and his student Niji. The Anbu disappeared instantly to look for the missing men. Where could they have gone? Naruto asked a little worried for the two men. I most have thought it safer to go somewhere else so they wouldn't be found by any Hyuga that could be looking to hurt Niji. Kakashi said as he moved to look out the widow, wondering where his oldest friend could have gone. Will the Anbu be able to find them? Isoribi asked, worried for the men. Naruto nodded next to her as he gave her a one-armed hug. Guy would have known not to go somewhere that he couldn't be found, worst case scenario is it takes a few hours to find him. Isoribi smiled accepting the answer, but the rest of the occupants in the room knew better. There was a chance that the Hyuga could have gotten to Guy and Niji and ambushed them before they could react. And even if Guy was one of the strongest jonin in Kanoha, it would still be possible for him to be killed if ambushed, he was no way immortal. If the Anbu didn't come back with the two men within the hour, then Naruto would take Kakashi, Anko, and Yamato to find the two and save them if need be. So what do we do now? Anko asked, she had moved to lean against the bare wall of the office, cleaning her nails with a kunai as she waited. Wait. Naruto shrugged, there wasn't much else to do. And after that. She added, an eyebrow raised. Naruto looked around the rest of the room, all of whom were looking towards him. I gained word of a summoning contract near the land of water. He told them. It may be necessary to even attempt facing the pedophile on equal ground. We already have quite a few contracts here Naruto-kun. The sand I may told him, even going as far as to gesture to Jiraiya, Kakashi, Anko, and himself. Wouldn't it be beneficial for you to just take on one of ours? Naruto nodded in agreement but it wouldn't do. How many of your summons have already faced or fought with the snakes? All of them answered in the affirmative, Anko even pointing out they shared the same summon. The pedo is and always will be a genius, to the highest degree. When he faces an enemy or fights with a companion, whether that be a genin or kage, he will leave that fight, only to relive it over and over again, until he understands every single detail of it, every move you made, every mistake, and every move. After a single fight he understands you to a degree that you may not even understand yourself. The Sand I Mei and Jiraiya both nodded in understanding, while the others looked like they wanted a little more information. So you need a summon that he won't be expecting, the Sand I Mei explained further. More importantly. Naruto added. I need a summon that he won't be able to beat. Giant summon. Kakashi said receiving a nod from Naruto and the Sand I Mei. I thought giants were rare, and almost all of them are already dedicated to a village. Anko pointed out, she had only ever heard of the Kanoha Three and the legendary Salamanders of the Rain. The rest that she had heard rumors about were either lost to time or hidden by the village that held them. They are extremely rare. Kakashi agreed. Which is why we need to move fast if we are going to find the one I know of. Naruto said. You said it's in the land of water right? Yamato asked, getting a nod from Naruto in answer. So it's some kind of water creature. The rest of the room nodded in agreement with the question, all curious as to what the boy had managed to find. Naruto smiled pointing the stoic man. And that is exactly why my summon will completely outclass Pito. Yamato furrowed his brow. I don't understand. He half asked half stated. The assumption that I would automatically bond with a summon who was related to water. Naruto as he reached behind his back, grasping Isoribi's hand before she could reach into his exposed side pouch. The girl's eyes widened and she attempted to get away only for Naruto to keep his grip tight and make her sit there with her hand in an acquired position. While it would be beneficial to me, it would also be a disadvantage if the pedo has found a way to mess with or neutralize water. Hence I will be going after a different class of summon. The adults had to agree with his reasoning, even though it was kinda hard to take him seriously, especially when Isoribi, who was fed up with her arm being stuck, suddenly bit down onto Naruto's other exposed hand with a fury, not that he reacted at all. So what's the summon? Anko asked again, slightly annoyed that he had yet to tell them. That. He stalled, leaning and slowly causing in the rest of the room to mimic him. Is a secret. He shot back to a relaxed position with a grin on his face, the rest of the room staring at him in different states of emotion. Anko who was now annoyed and furious with the blonde boy, was reeling back to throw her ever-present kunai, not noticing the small tendril of water that formed behind her and latched onto the kunya. But as her muscles tensed to throw the sudden swirl of chakra near the door caused the group, all except Isoribi, to turn to and watch as Guy and Niji appeared, Niji looking like he wanted to attack his sensei, who had a mischievous glint to his ever-present grin. And where were you two? Naruto asked after a moment's pause where he had forced the water behind Anko to wrap around the soles of Anko's sandals and freeze to the ground, not that she noticed. Where no one would find us. 
Guy yelled happily, proud of his hiding spot only for his mood to dim when Niji elaborated after. The fool thought it funny to sneak us into Hiyashi-sama's bedroom and hide us in his closet. Naruto and Aisuribi, who was finally free of her brother leaving her teeth marks on his arm, chuckled at Niji's frazzled look. Not bad. Kakashi commented, his book was out again, and everyone turned to him in surprise, no one accepting him to actually compliment his unacknowledged friend. Kakashi-kun. You finally acknowledge my youthfulness. Guy yelled as he suddenly appeared near Kakashi and tried to hug him only for Kakashi to hold the man back with his free hand. The room watched as Kakashi looked up at Guy with a blank look, Anko and Yamato smiling at what they knew was to come. You say something, Guy. He asked with a cool attitude, causing the room to laugh and Guy to fall in a crying heap, mumbling about the power of youth being dimmed by unyouthfulness. Moving on. The sand I may chuckled as he passed the crying man on his way to his desk. He opened a few drawers, looking through all of them before pulling a sheet of paper, everyone seeing Niji's picture on the front. Now I believe I might know what Naruto-kun had planned for Niji when he sent him here. Which would be? Niji asked, looking towards the younger teen who had kicked his ass so thrilly. You wanted to do for Niji what I did for you, correct Naruto-kun? The sand I may asked receiving a nod from the blonde. The elderly man smiled before signing a few things on the sheet of paper, before placing it back in his desk. Well congratulations are in order Nichi-kun. The room, besides the Hokage and Naruto looked confused. For what Hokage-sama? Niji asked respectively, but the hint of skepticism was still there in his voice. Their apprenticeship to Jureya-kun of course. The man counted down in his head three seconds before the room exploded in noise, more so from Jureya and Niji than the rest. He simply smiled as they yelled, sitting in his chair, and for once in many many years he found himself enjoying his job. I am a leader. The sand I may spoke from behind his glass of alcohol, in front of him sitting in the two ever-present chairs were Jiraiya and Kakashi, each with a similar glass in their hands. I have been a leader for so many years, through wars, through peace, and worst of all through disaster. I have demanded such loyalty from my people that the expectation of them giving their lives for me hasn't weighed on my conscience in decades. And worst of all, I have begun to see each new genin as not a person, not a child, but a pawn. A piece of a board game. And yet I am allowed to be a leader. Gurei watched as the elderly man aged a decade in front of his eyes. He hadn't seen his sensei this broken since the day he had greeted Jureya back after the failed rescue attempt of his other student, Jureya's best friend. Bakashi, who'd never seen the Hokage show such emotion in age was stunned into silence. Only but barely listening to what was being said and still only following it slightly. This was not a leader of a great village. This was not the man who the world feared. This was. Age. And if he was truthful with himself he would admit that he never wished to be old enough to understand completely what the Hokage was telling him. Do you know what I realized today? The sand I may ask them, refilling his own glass before filling theirs. But Sensei. Jureya asked respectfully, falling back into the role of student, a role he hadn't been in for years. I realized that I am no longer fit to be a leader. Jureya and Kakashi couldn't say a thing as the man downed the rest of his drink, before turning his chair to stare out the window at the very village he now lead. I don't believe I have been fit to lead in many a year. But I could not step down. I could not allow my village to be led by a fool that would either take us to a war-filled grave or allow us to fall without a fight to other fools. So I waited, watched, and in the end lost my way. The elderly man paused in his speech, his eyes locked on a large apartment building only a few blocks away, a building where a good amount of his shinobi slept and recovered from long missions and training sessions. More importantly though it held a small boy who has seen far too much in his younger sister that he had protected from the hell that was this world. You wish to retire Sensei? Jiraiya asked finally, confusion was evident on both his and Kakashi's faces in the sudden turn of their leader. What rank would you have given Naruto-kun today? The Sandai may asked the two men, still not facing them. Jiraiya and Kakashi looked towards each other for a moment before Jiraiya answered. Considering that he was able to beat Niji, Mizuki, and Kakashi, it would be probable to award him the rank of Jonin. It may even be prudent to make him an Anbu for a few months to get used to the style, then move him to Anbu Captain. Kakashi added. His skills would be priceless for almost all their missions, and would serve to save a lot of lives that would normally be lost. What were you thinking Sensei? Jureya asked once Kakashi had finished. The Sandai may finally turn back to them, placing his glass to the side. After the fights I had fully intended to award Naruto-kun the rank of special jonin, only his lack of missions holding him back from a full jonin. But the events that happened after made me pause. Once more he stopped, his thoughts on the events of today, especially on what happened with Niji and how Naruto had handled the situation. Coupled with the his analysis of Orochimaru had brought the elderly man to a startling conclusion. The day I saw a young boy who knew how to lead. 
I saw a boy that could one day lead this village into an age that has never been seen before, a strong, rich, and most of all peacefully age. Today I saw myself when I was younger. Bakashi looked at Jureya who looked almost pained at his old teacher's words. Are you saying you want to make Naruto kun the Hokage? He asked looking towards the old man like he was losing it. The Sandai Mei shook his head slowly. I'm saying that Naruto kun would be the perfect Kage. He sighed slowly, standing from his chair and moving towards the door to go home and sleep. Yet I will never be able to allow him to hold that title. He stopped at the door, locking eyes with both men. For I am a leader of a world that should burn in hell. A few blocks away in a large apartment building, a boy sat cross leg in front of a small table, an area of maps and papers strung out in front of him, showing his plans that he had created to increase the security of his village, along with a few tricks for the very building he sat in. With a tired motion he finished his work, leaving it to be put away in the morning, and rose to go to bed. On his way to his room he paused in front of the slightly open door, pushing it hard enough to allow him to see inside to the young girl who had curled the blanks around herself, a small plush fox in her hands as she slept peacefully. He let a smile grace his face as he shut the door and walked into his room to sleep. His thoughts on the girl in the next room who he did so much for, just for her protection, so that she would never see the world he had seen. A stray thought crossed his mind, where would he be if he hadn't found her? But just as fast as it came, it was gone. It no longer mattered how it happened, or why. All that mattered was the fact that he would die to protect her innocence. Die to protect his little sister. X. The next day saw Naruto and Isoribi up early, and making their way towards an out-of-the-way training area that was numbered 18. A small pond of water was to the side of the clearing, trees filling the rest of their view, but the water was evident enough as to why Jiraiya had told them to meet him here. Not supposed to be here for an for two hours. Isoribi whined lowly, Naruto had woken her up when the sun first cracked the horizon and demanded that she come with him to train, while they waited to meet Jiraiya, who wouldn't even show up for another two hours or so. You're meeting your team today. Naruto told her with a smile as she fell back onto her back and acted like she was asleep. You need to be ready for whatever test the dog gives you and show your team that you're worthy to cover their backs in a fight even though you're a few years younger than them. So you want me to be tired by the time I meet them? She asked, glaring at her older brother who only laughed. Start your warm-ups then come to me when you're done. The girl glared at him until he raised an eyebrow at her, spurring her to get up and start jogging, though the glare never left. I don't see you warming up. She whispered as she passed, not expecting him to hear it. I woke up an hour ago to warm up. If you want to join me you're more than welcome. Her eyes widened as he spoke before she quickened her pace. No this works. She yelled over her shoulder, missing his chuckle at her expense as he moved to the small pond. Kneeling down to get closer to the water he frowned in thought. The water here was dirty and tainted with years of chakra taint. To anyone else it would have been fine, a little dirty maybe but still clean and usable, the taint of old chakra completely missed. But to him and was unacceptable. Water was not meant to be soiled by the chakra of others who had overpowered the jutsu they used, resulting in the attack to be hard to control and temperamental. Water like this was the reason that he hated when someone would dare to use water jutsu against him. They didn't understand what they were doing, all they cared about was the result. They pushed Chakra into the water, demanding it to change and move to their bidding. It's because of this that he could turn their own attacks against them without trouble. Water Jutsu were not meant to be pushed or demanded of, water was meant to be asked and guided. You put enough Chakra into the water for it to understand what it was that was being asked of it, then once it understood you helped guide it in the right direction, allowing the water to run its course. In all his days, as low as they may be, he had only met a single woman who understood his concepts. Understood how to truly use water. She understood much like he does that water is and always will be the most powerful of the elements that no one will ever use. It is time to heal you. Naruto spoke to the water before taking off his vest and placing it onto the ground, with the boda bags facing up before slipping off his shoes and socks, and in a steady and smooth pace, stepped onto the pond and walked to the center where he sat cross-legged. Closing his eyes he focused on the water below him, reaching out with his soul to touch every drop of water, every inch. He felt the taint that riddled the water and with a calming sigh, pulled the water to form around him in a solid dome, and began the slow but forever steady process of removing the taint from the water. Isoribi walked up to her older brother, watching as the water swirled around him, she knew that if it was night she would be able to see the dull glow of power radiating from him. But it was not to be, and all she could do was feel the foreign chakra being expelled into the air, where it would later dissipate. She waited for a few minutes before moving on to do her own things. Her brother had started training her in the art of lightning manipulation, it had been a big surprise for the both of them that her primary element was in fact lightning as they had always assumed, due to her background, that she would hold a strong water affinity. 
She had feared that her brother would discard her once he found out that she didn't hold the same affinity as him, but he had reassured her almost instantly that he was proud of her. The next day he had begun to research the finer workings of lightning manipulation, all of his own jutsu coming from his trident. They had begun training her in lightning manipulation almost a month ago, and she had already begun to see the signs of her work. Taking two senbin needles from her pouch, she held them at arm's length and began to focus on manipulating her chakra into the needles and converting it to be electrical enough for an arch to connect between the two pieces of metal without shocking herself. She had just began to create sparks the other day and was hopeful to make a connection in the next week or so. From his own sphere of water Naruto smiled at the girl, she was doing wonders in her manipulations and combined with the water scrolls she held, he had little doubt that she would be taken or killed without one hell of a fight. He just had to figure out a way to tell her that he had switched all of her senbin when she was sleeping to a special senbin that had a rubber core, effectively isolating all electricity. She was literally fighting to overwhelm the very nature of rubber while learning how to conduct and control her affinity. When the time came that she could conduct an arch between the rubber cord senbin, he would switch them all back to copper-based senbin and watch the fireworks when she overloads the metal and creates a lightning bolt on accident. She would probably be upset at him for tricking her, but she was going to be so much stronger for it. He allowed his focus to go back to the water, trusting his sister to not try anything too dangerous. Almost a full hour passed, both of them doing what their own task though Naruto had finished his long ago he still kept himself encased in the water, the peace it brought to him was so great he often found it hard to let it go when not extremely necessary. Yo. Naruto suppressed the urge to flinch away from the voice, only barely keeping his cool due to the fact that he recognized the voice without fail. Finally allowing the water to fall back into its hold, while keeping his footing at the top of it, he turned behind him where his old sensei stood with that damn goofy smile on his face. You're early. Naruto asked, speaking loud enough to alert his sister of the toad's presence. She kept her focus on the senbin, much to his pride. Is it so wrong of me to want to check up on my favorite pupil and his lovely new sister? Jiraiya asked while moving to his side, clasping his hand on his pupil's shoulder, only to pull it back and wipe the water on his hand off on his pants. Must you always do that? Yes. Naruto smiled as the man pouted to himself. Would you like to meet her? He asked quietly, he scowled at the volume of his own voice, upset that this was affecting him so much, but still nerves at his sensei's reaction. Of course. Jiraiya smiled a small, sincere smile as they moved to the young girl who was still focusing on her senbin, a spark on each senbin, momentarily connecting only to fall away from lack of power. Would it fall? Jiraiya asked, his age allowing him to realize that if it was actually metal, it wouldn't have fallen out unless she took the power away from it. Rubber core. Naruto whispered to him, electing a knowing smile from the man, as they came to a stop in front of the girl. Catfish do you want to meet your grandfather? Aisaribi's eyes snapped open, loosing all concentration on her senbin as she stood with a large smile. Jiraiya I would like you to meet Aisaribi Uzumaki. Aisaribi I would like you to meet your Ajis and Jiraiya. His sister suddenly looked nervous as she took a step forward to be closer to his sensei, while holding out a small slightly shacking hand. Hello. Her voice was small as she greeted him, and for a moment Naruto would swear he saw a tear in the man's eyes as he dropped to his knees and pulled the girl into a tight hug, kissing the top of her head when her arms flew around his neck. It's a pleasure to finally meet you Asari-chan. He whispered to the now extremely enthusiastic girl who hugged him as tight as she could. She was so happy to have a brother, and now she had a grandpa too. Enough of the mushy stuff. Naruto yelled causing his sister to giggle at him as Jiraiya let her go. Unless you have figured out how to make the arch. She shook her head. Then get back to work. He yelled in mock anger causing the girl to roll her eyes before she sat back down and began to work again on creating the arch. Naruto winked at the girl before motioning for Jiraiya to follow him back towards the small pond. The man followed close behind, both falling into a comfortable silence as Naruto began to manipulate some of the water into a herd of horses that grazed the surface of the lake like real horses. You seem troubled Naruto-kun. Jiraiya asked after a moment. Naruto had to nod, not finding a reason to lie to his sensei. I fear. He said, changing the horses into a replica of himself and Orochimaru. They began to fight each other, water flying in the air and mocking the different jutsu they used. Jiraiya watched in a slight daze as the water Naruto began to push Orochimaru back only for the man to allow a small snake to fall from his sleeve and slither by the distracted Naruto. Slowly another figure rose from the water to form Isaribi who was all smiles and cheers for her brother, only for the snake to sink its fangs into her neck just as Naruto killed Orochimaru. Naruto rushed to her side and held her in his arms as she slowly began to drip away until finally nothing was left in his arms and he was alone on the surface, only to fall in a moment later. He once told me. Naruto started to say slowly when the show was over. That. 
My drive for vengeance would hold a hand in my destruction. Of course, I never believed you. But now. He motioned to the prone girl who was shacking in concentration. Now I can't stop myself from thinking that I should no longer go after the pedo. There is far too much to lose, not only for me, but for her too. Gurea stared at the girl instead of his still very young apprentice. He had worked so hard to convince the boy off of his path of revenge, only for this girl to do it without even planning to. What a Virachimaru team. He still needs to be stopped, and I doubt that he had forgotten about you. Naruto shrugged. Like I said last night. I will get a summoning contract and continue training just like always. But I don't think that I can risk chasing after the man, especially if it means leaving catfish to the darkness of this world. Naruto paused to glance at the girl, smiling as more and more sparks appeared on the senban. She was close. He thought to himself before turning back to his sensei. I will do what is necessary to protect her. If that means that I must protect this village, then so be it. But if there is ever a time where this village is no longer safe for her, then I will no longer reside here, and I hope that I will not be alone in leaving. Gureya raised a single brow at the boy, but nodded nonetheless. Naruto and now Aisiribi were his family, the only family he had left. If a time came where the village was a danger to either of them and they choose to leave for a safer place, then he too would leave with them. He loved Konoha, loved his home, but he'd be damned if he allowed his family to be driven away from him. And as far as I'm concerned with the pedo. I will deal with him on my own terms, when I can be sure of the safety of Catfish-chan without a doubt. And your own safety? Jiraiya added with a smirk. Naruto nodded, mimicking his sensei's smirk. And my own safety. You never did answer as to why you came early? Naruto asked. Tsuritobi sensei wanted me to bring you to his office after you dropped off Asari-chan with Kakashi-kun. Apparently he wants to send your team on a training mission of sorts to the land of water. Naruto smirked at the man. Shouldn't we meet a few times to create some strategies or something? Gureya waved the question off. That's the point of the mission. You'll be sent into the land of water for a two weeks to learn about and adjust to each other without the interference of the village. Why the land of water? Jureya chuckled at the boy with a raised eyebrow, causing Naruto to glare at him. Besides the obvious. At the end of the two weeks your team will be tasked with escorting the Konoha emissary back to Konoha. The two weeks in between is for your team to get to know the route you will be taking. Naruto shook his head at the plan, smiling at the blatant lie, but then again it would give him the time he needed to find the contract. Maybe he would have enough time to speak with a few old friends, some of which might even be tasked with escorting his team. So you're saying we're being sent for the contract, but in order to get it done without anyone questioning it, the monkey is saying that we're going to protect an emissary, plotting out our return route for two weeks. Jureya nodded with a large grin on his face. Fair enough. Akashi Khan should be here soon to pick up Asari-chan to take her to meet her team. Jiraiya informed him. Once he does you should head straight to Siratobi sensei's office. Don't bother saying goodbye to Asari-chan since you won't be leaving for a few days at the earliest. Thanks, pervy toad. Sure thing kid. Jiraiya patted his shoulder again, scowling at the water on his hand. By the way I ran out of your scrolls about a month ago, and I don't want to go back out without a few. How many will you need? Naruto asked. I'll be gone for about a four days or so, but I'll be traveling into the land of stone, so I was thinking ten, maybe fifteen to be safe. Do you want a mix of dragons, waves, and foxes? Gureya shook his head. Just waves for now. I'd be looking to run, not fight, so waves would be the best. That works. Naruto agreed though when Jureya turned to leave he found Naruto's hand held out in front of him. With a heavy sigh he reached back into his pocket and pulled out a piece of taffy which he dropped in his apprentice's hand. He raised an eyebrow at the boy when he didn't retract his hand. Really? He asked. Naruto glared at the man. It'll take me about 30 minutes to create the scrolls and another 10 to fill them. One piece ain't gonna cut it. Gurei rolled his eyes at the boy before reaching into his pocket and pulling out the rest of the small bag of taffy he had. The boy smiled as he snatched it before turning his back to the man, looking towards the pond once more while pocketing the candy for later. Gurei shook his head with a smile before he turned to leave once more. I've got some research to do. I'll see you later tonight. Naruto scowled at the man's back, his research was a waste of time for the most part. Though he had to admit to himself that the man sure did know how to make money without working hard. Are you okay Nichin? Aisiribi called from her spot in the middle of the field. Stop stalling brat. Naruto yelled. The dog'll be here soon, and I want to see at least the start of an arch by that time. The girl huffed, her purple hair flipping in the air as she focused on the senban again, her anger giving her enough drive to create a small arch that actually lasted for a few moments before falling. Just trying to be nice. She mumbled loud enough for him to hear, though her eyes didn't hold any real anger, as she started to make the light arch over and over again, her lips twitching as she tried to fight down a smile. 
That's my girl. Naruto whispered to himself with a smile. He knew without a doubt that she was going to be a strong Kanoichi one day. And he would be damned if he wasn't there to see it happen. Thanks guys for watching the video, that's it for today, hope did you enjoyed if you do please leave a like share and subscribe.